but when I show you that, I do not provide you any solution. So what we have to do is really to identify the markers which present high correlation with the trait of interest. So that's what we are trying to do, identify the genomic regions that contribute to the trait of interest. So we already have some information in Sorghum, for instance, you have some major genes that affect several traits, and they have been summarized by Emma Mace and David Jordan in 2010. And here's just one example on the chromosome 6. You have some dwarf gene on maturity gene at the top. So you can use them if you want to develop high sorghum, small sorghum, uh, early maturating sorghum, or late maturating one. You really can use that directly now. In addition, we have some information regarding the control of quantitative traits. Uh, so these analyses have been performed in elite uh, uh, biparental populations m most of the time, or in crosses between elite and other, other genotypes. And this has been done for a whole bunch of traits, like grain yield, grain size, and morphology, and stuff like that. And all this information has been summarized on the sorghum genetic maps. And here is just one example for seed weight. Uh, so these guys, they summarized all the QTL experiments that have been done, and they localized the genomic region of interest that controls seed size. And what they saw is that it's really consistent between the experiment. So you can take advantage of that to select the genotypes that have a lar large or small uh, seed size. So in our case, we apply this strategy to develop some elite line regarding grain yield and grain quality in Mali. So we already had some elite lines, local ones, and the goal was to develop from this cross the best progeny that will accumulate the favorable alleles from the two parents. So here we are really doing multi-trade selection. We want to select for grain yield, grain quality, flowering time on plant eight. So what we want is really to pick the genomic regions that are favorable in Chandugu and the one in Kenin Keni and combine them in the same genotype. So actually what we want is one genotype that will combine 33 different genomic regions and we want to put it in the same plant. And if you do that by classical genealogic selection, you will need to produce millions of progeny to be able to find the one you want. So the idea was to use genomic information to follow up the different alleles and try to accumulate them in the progenies we were wanting to select. So to do that, we developed a large F4 population. This F4 population was characterized in multi-environment trials where we characterized grain yield, plant age, flowering time. So here you have the two parents and then the progenies. And at the same time, we characterize their molecular diversity. So we identify the polymorphisms that segregated in the population. And then the game was to try to find some links between these nucleotide sites and the, the properties in terms of grain yield. And it's just one example here. These SNPs did not have any effect on the grain yield, but this one had. Indeed, you can see that the genotypes that have the A allele have a lower grain yield compared to the C allele. And the nice things with molecular markers is that you can localize them on the sorghum genome. So here, in just one example, you have one chromosome of the sorghum genome, and each colon corresponds to one trait we have evaluated in one trial. And you have three colors here mainly. You have red, it means that the good alleles, alleles come from the P1 parent. You have blue, it means that the good allele come from the other parent. And you have green, it means that you, you don't really care about this genome portion. So, Based on this information, we can derive what we are looking for. For this specific chromosome, we are looking for individuals that have red alleles at the top and some green alleles in the middle. So all the efforts we are going to put in this selection process will be to converge towards this molecular ideotype. To do that, so we had our F4, we genotyped them, so we are able to say at this particular position, the allele from this plant comes from the P1 parent, and this allele from this plant comes from the P2 parent. 
Taking that into account, we can calculate that their genetic value, and we can recombine them in order to increase the mean of the population. And you, could, you can do that several times. So along the different recurrent selection uh, generation, you are going to increase the mean of your population, keeping the, the variability. So here, it's just an example of what happened. Uh, I remind you that it's what we are looking for. We look for genotypes that have red allele at the top and green in the middle. And here it's the evolution of the proportion of the red and green allele along the different generation of selection. So in the F3 we were here, so we really increase the proportion of red allele in this case. And here in this genome position we go towards the green allele. So we really managed to follow up the, the favorable alleles. And then we took the best from the C1 and C2 uh, generation and we compared them with local varieties. And uh, you have to believe me, it worked. It was much more faster than classical genealogical breeding and it was more accurate. Uh, so as Jeff mentioned, this is easy when you work within family. And that's what we did, so it was quite easy actually. But the real problem is to transfer that to other populations. Like when you are using a breeding program, you have a lot of parents that contributed to your, to your program. And in this case, you won't be able to use this type of approach. So and we can go back to that later, but in this case, when you have a really large panel of diversity, you really need to identify the gene of interest. So to do that, we have strategies, which are called genome-wide association mapping. The idea is just to start with a large panel of diversity. So in our case, we analyzed 400 different accessions that we phenotyped for different traits, mainly linked to biomass yield and biomass composition, as we were interested in feed and also energy and biomaterial uh, targets. So we checked that the heritabilities were high, so we were confident in our data, and then we genotyped all the 400 accessions to identify the polymorphic sites. Taking that into account, we calculated the correlation between the markers. So on the x-axis, you have the different chromosome of the, uh, of the, of the sorghum. <coughs> on each bone corresponds to one specific molecular marker. And on the y-axis, you have the correlation between the marker variability and the trait variability. Here, just one example for the cell wall lignin content, which is once again interesting for feed and energy and stuff like that. Uh, so if, if you put the statistical significance threshold, you can see that we identify three different regions, and we went further, we checked which genes were below these different regions. And I'm going to focus on the chromosome 3. Below this position in the genome, actually you have a lakease gene that has been identified in Arabidopsis, a small weed, and also in maize, which is not a weed. And they impact both the, the quality and the quantity of lignin in the, in the cell wall. So really, this strategy works to identify genes. But uh, we have some problem, of course. It does not resolve everything. We have IG by E. It means that we do not have always good correlation between the marker information and the phenotypes. So we really have to run that on different sites and experiments. The second limit to, limitation to this strategy is that sometimes it's difficult to transfer the result to the breeding program because it's just because, as mentioned Jeff again, uh, you have a lot of exotic lines, so they are really different from the material you are using in your breeding program, so it can take time. But, so taking this into account, the fact that we are efficient in using marker assisted selection in biparental population, on the fact that association studies can provide us with new alleles of interest. Uh, David Jordan in Australia with his team developed a strategy where he used an adapted parent, which is our elites, and he crossed them with unadapted parents. When I am saying unadapted, it means that they do not fit to the expectation of the genotype you want in your field but they will provide you with new alleles of interest for resistance or quality or stuff like that. And instead of doing some genealogic selection from the F1, he, he did an, addi an, an additional back cross to obtain the BC1F1. 
and then derive the, until the BC1 F4. And actually, it works well. Here, you have one of the parents, which is a wide related of sorghum. Here is the F1 hybrid, which is really bad. But in the BC1 F4 progeny, you can really manage to identify what you want. So this strategy really works for breeding. It's, it has been proved and it's widely used now. And the, the nice thing about that is that it's also really nice design to go to, to identify the, the genes of interest. Here it's the donor parents, which are really diverse. Here it's the recurrent parents. And you can see that the pieces of DNA that come from the donor are really thin. So you can really identify the gene of interest that will be of interest in your breeding program. So this type of design has been developed by several teams in the world, uh, in the US. On us, we use that to improve grain yield and quality for, um, for Western Africa, mainly Mali and Burkina. So what we did is that we crossed, we crossed three elites here in orange with a large panel of donors, 45 different donors. So we obtained 47 back cross population and for a total of more, of more than 4,000 BC1 and 4 families. We phenotyped them, so we obtained some families that are really good in terms of grain yield. We genotype them and we run the association analysis. And here, we really improve the resolution of the mapping of the gene of interest. So this is just good for geneticists. Now we go for breeders. So we took the, the best ones and we compared them with uh, allied variety, allied local varieties. And we really showed that this was working. So here is the allied from past uh, project, and here is the BC1F4 derived from this design. And it re we really managed to identify relevant genotypes. So until now, on Jeff also, we talked only about using the variability available on, uh, in sorghum, which is great because sorghum has a huge variability and it's a real power for breeders. But sometimes you want to increase its variability. So there are different strategies to do that. You can do that through chemical mutation. So there have been a number of different uh, mutant libraries that have been developed. The last one uh, came from this year. They developed 6,000 mutants and based on this EMS strategy. And what they did is that they sequenced a subset of that. 256 mutant lines were sequenced at the world genome level. And they managed to identify some mutation in 95% of the sorghum genes. This means that we, can, we have a really nice resource to make some gene validation that we can use after in our breeding program. And the other thing, which is, can be uh, valorized directly in breeding, is that it allows the identification of new mutants of interest for the breeding programs. I took here the example of the BMR. We talked about them earlier in the morning. At this stage, we know that there are three different mutants for BMR, BMR2, 6, and 12. And within this EMS population, they discovered six additional genes impacting the BMR phenotype. So this can be used for breeding right now. Another strategy to increase the variability is through genome editing. So I'm sure most of you heard about the CRISPR-Cas9 strategy, which is in debate at the European level. Uh, so this is working in sorghum, also the, the transformation efficiency is not really high. It's also the tool, a tool that can be used. This can be used for what? To introduce large deletion of, on rearrangement of the sorghum chromosomes or to make some single point mutation. So this provides you with a really nice tool again to validate gene function. So this is going to accelerate the gene dis discovery and the development of breeding tools. And of course, if we want, we can use CRISPR-Cas9 to generate new variability. Once again, I think that in sorghum, we have already a natural variability which is really large. We can do a lot of things without that, but we have these tools. So I take, I go up a little bit. So I talked a, a lot about markers and how to use them, but I think there are also some we need to think about the strategy we apply to our breeding programs. Uh, the genetic of maize was revolutionized when they started to use this type of scheme, reciprocal recurrent selection. I think we can really start to use that for sorghum for, spe for specific traits as there are groups 
that present high heterosis that have been identified. So we can really run some selection program within the different pools and then cross them. Then I think we have to continue to do some QTL and GWAS analysis because they will provide you with nice tools to follow the line of interest. We have to move toward genom genomic selection. So the idea here is that we are not anymore interested in gene effect. We just want to make a model in which you are going to have markers on your genomes and you want to predict the phenotype directly. You don't care about who is acting, who is doing what, you just want a prediction. This can, can be done uh, in training population where you are going to phenotype and genotype. You set up your calibration and then you apply this calibration to your breeding material. This has proved to be eff efficient in, in other species. And clearly we have to take advantage of the NBT. I got the last slide. So here we are really in personal thoughts, so you are allowed to disagree completely. Uh, the first thing is I think sorghum breeding is efficient. So we have really the tools on the guys that will allow to provide the farmers with nice genotypes and, and that will fit the expectation of the end user. So Patrice is going to talk about the target. Uh, I think also that European sorghum breeding has specificities. We have specific target environments, so we need specific research for that. Uh, I also think that all what is done in the US, in Australia, in India is highly relevant for us. So we really have to consider this information uh, and, and take it for us too. And the last thing I think is that we do not need to coordinate this action. Whatever you are going to do, the breeders will breed and researchers will search in their own way. You won't be able to make change their mind. They are going to do whatever they want. But I think we can re really have huge benefits for collaboration, aggregation of results, and exchange of experience. And for that, we really need a common place. We need a place to discuss exchange. And, uh, I think I've got, yeah, I just want to acknowledge the two guys that contributed to this talk. Gilles is our sorghum breeder, he's in the room here, and Jean-Francois, he did the, the two main projects I presented, our partners on the biomass projects we are currently running. So if you have some questions at the end, I would be happy to try to answer you. Thanks. Thank you very much and congratulations for the presentation and for the work that you do. Unfortunately, I don't know any joke about genotypes, so <laughs> I'll have to pass that. Okay. Um, I give the floor to Patrice. Yeah. Oh, Patrice Janson uh, will have the floor for uh, his presentation. Thank you very much, please. Hello, everybody. My name is Patrice Janson. I am uh, here uh, to represent uh, the Pro Sorgo Association uh, based in France, and I'm also sorghum breeder for a private seed company in France. So, uh, to present the association, uh, Pro Sorgo Association, it's an association uh, with uh, seeds, seven seeds company. Some of them are working for, on research program for sorghum. The other are only uh, um, uh, involved in the in the uh, in the seeds uh, improvement uh, development uh, of sorghum to sell the seed in France and in Europe. We are working on uh, on research with uh, some uh, other uh, French uh, company like uh, the CIRAD, like Arvalis Public Company, and uh, also uh, the INRA. Uh, to develop uh, uh, some uh, specific uh, target, like you, you saw in the previous uh, presentation, uh, especially the equation for the digestibility. We, you saw this this morning with uh, Alexis Ferrar. We are working with uh, the CIRAD uh, on the biomass uh, for the future program to develop onto uh, sorghum 
not also for biomass, but also for grain, for sugar, for some uh, all what what can we do for uh, what can we do with uh, sorghum in Europe? And uh, we also uh, work on the promotional activities for the development of sorghum cultivation in France. And uh, we uh, we are working together for for sorghum. The whole but also usual axis of research for sorghum in Europe are first yield, sure. We continue to work on yield. Uh, we increase yield from 0 0.5 to 0 0.8 quintal per hectare per year. Uh, it's necessary to continue in this, uh, in this way compared to corn where the, the benefit could be better. Uh, the hardiness of the variety, because we have to adapt sorghum for Europe, north of Europe, and so we, we want to develop sorghum also more in the north of Europe. The quality, no tannin for grain. As uh, now, uh, the first variety registered in France, uh, low tannin, was in 1980. And uh, since this date, all the varieties registered in France are low tannin content. So we continue and we, the objective is to register all, only low tannin content for the European market. We are also working on agro, agronomic comportment, global agronomic comportment, we'll see after, on some diseases. What change? In Europe now, in Europe and in the world, the climate change, the temperature increase. As you can see, since 80, 1880, we, we have two degrees temperature more in global world. Uh, so we have to consider this evolution when we are breeding for the new variety. Global temperature increase in the north hemisphere, northern hemisphere, and more than in the southern hemisphere. So it's important, it could be benefit for the sorghum. As you saw previously, sorghum, as, as you know, sorghum is more tolerant to stress, to hot temperature than corn and than other crop cultivated at the moment in Europe. So it could be an advantage for sorghum. <coughs> also, the level of carbon dioxide increase. As you know, it could be a big problem for the human population in the world because it's a it's a pollution, but it could be a, it's also a benefit for the plant. As you know, all the plant need carbon dioxide to, to grow. And more you have carbon dioxide in the, in the atmosphere, more the plant grow. The mean percentage yield increase could be really important for the cereal. C3 CRR, it's close to 50%. For the four C4 CRR, like corn and sorghum, it's close to 20%. So we can consider that with hot temperature and the increase of the level of carbon dioxide in the air, it will be more profitable for sorghum. Sure. Maybe. But in fact, We will see after that with hot temperature, the plant prefer air uh, hot with hot, hot temperature and high level of dioxide carbon. It's benefit for plant, but we have to breed for plant tolerant for this hot temperature, especially is Eastern Continental Europe, 
when we can have some peak of temperature in summer, and it could affect the pollen germination, the, the pollen fertility. So it's really important to take in consideration this character for the future, the tolerance to the hot temperature for the pollen. We also have to take in consideration the lowest temperature we can have because with the climatic evolution, the temperature increase or decrease sometime rapidly. And also we can have some cold period in June, in July, which could affect the fertility of the plant and we can observe some apical sterility and sorghum. So it's really important to consider and to breed for this uh, tolerance, cold or hot temperature, to develop the new variety. What changed also uh, with the increase of temperature, also the rainfall. So water availability will change. And as you can see on the map, it's not really good for the Europe. Water availability could decrease from 20% in the next 30 years. And also, as you know, uh, the good balance with the increase of temperature, increase of carbon dioxide, will be that the water availability increase because more you have the capacity to produce and to, 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 yes, to produce biomass, to produce biomass, you need water. If the water availability decreases from 20%, it could be a big impact of the growing of the plant and, in fact, the benefit we can have with the increase of temperature and the increase of carbon dioxide level could be completely uh, uh, inexistent with the decrease of the water availability. So we have to now to work more on the drought stress for sorghum. So we try to manage different main strategy, different strategy. First is the horizon strategy, breed for very early cultivated variety. The objective is that the flowing period will be before the drought period in summer, and so after, as you we'll see in the end of the afternoon. After flowering, sorghum need less water than before flowering period. So the advantage we had with very early variety could be really important to maintain the stability of the yield. We also try to plant earlier than we do at the moment. What that mean? That means we have to decrease the germination temperature threshold. You know for sorghum, it's recommended 12 degrees in the soil. Uh, compared to corn, corn is 6 degrees. So the difference is really important. An advantage will be to plant earlier the sorghum, maybe like corn at the beginning of April. At the moment, it's not possible because we can have frost in April, and so it's a risk for the farmer. So we have to work on the, this character on sorghum to plant earlier. One other character with no link with the precedent, the germination temperature, is the capacity, the early vigor of growing. And so we also have to work on this character in fact, if we plant at the same date in May that we do actually at the moment, we also have an advantage if we have more vigor at the early stage.
to avoid the stress in summer. We also have to work on the global comportment for droughts that stay green. In Australia, David Jordan works a lot. It's a specialist on this. We work on stomachal regulation, on road development, on grow rates, on the water efficiency. We have to work on all these topics to adapt sorghum for the future for the climatic condition in Europe. An example to compare corn and sorghum, efficiency for corn and sorghum, two different situations, irrigated and not irrigated. Efficiency for corn is better than sorghum in irrig irrigated field. Efficiency is the quantity of dry matter per hectare of per millimeter of water you produce, okay? So, compared to corn, it's, uh, sorghum efficiency is lower in irrigated condition. But, as you can see, in non-irrigated condition, the advantage is really for sorghum. So, in the future, with water availability, the decrease of the water availability, uh, advantage could be for sorghum, especially in Central and Eastern Europe. Other graph to explain this, for grain and for silage. For silage, the water need for sorghum is more important than for grain because the plant is higher. The biomass product per hectare is higher. So that's normal that we need more water for silage sorghum, biomass sorghum than for grain. With the evolution of the climate, we also have new problem. The impact is the increase of the pest population. And we can observe now in France since uh, for, for, the 20, for 20 years, main damage with in the south of France with helicopter par migera. And uh, it could be a big problem. It could affect more than 10% of the yield of the field. And so it's uh, damage and panicle, the, the head, the, the grain at milk stage. It's uh, difficult to, to manage. We have to, to spray some insecticide in the field. And as you know, the use of uh, phytosanitary sanitary product is, uh, is not recommended at, uh, at this stage. And uh, it's preferable to avoid. So uh, maybe we have to, it will be difficult because we don't have uh, genetic resources adapted to control this pest. We don't want to develop GMO strategy in Europe for sorghum. So it's, uh, it's important to look on the sorghum diversity. As you can see previously, we have a big sorghum diversity to, to see if we can have some tolerance of some QTL, which could induce tolerance in the, our sorghum variety to control this pest. Also, we have the same borers that we have in corn. Uh, you know, the, the heat mineral sorghum, and we have a lot. And some year, like this year, it could affect a lot the lodging of the field. As all sorghum contain more or less sugar in the stem, they light, especially the sorghum, in some forage variety. Now we want to develop forage variety for silage. And we try to increase sugar in the stem because sugar is really important. It's energy, global energy, used by the bacteria too for the fermentation. And so, 
with the high level of sugar we have in the stem, also the borer prefer to develop onto, to, to, to be in the sorghum than in corn. So a new, a new topic and your axis, axis of research is to look on the diversity of the sorghum to find some cutel, some possibility to manage and to limit the infestation of this pest in our crop, in our field. One other pest which could uh, be really important, some year we have, some other year we don't have, is the halfids. What temperature? Plant more sensitive to the drought, stress, it could be uh, important, we can have an important development of the halfids. We don't have the sugarcane halfid at the moment. We expect it will be limited to the USA and uh, America. <laughs> but we also have some problem in, uh, with halfids some years. So it's possible to apply the insecticide, but we have some possibility with gen the genetic to manage this, uh, this pest. So we have to look now on our future variety for this character. We have two main diseases, two main diseases for sorghum in Europe. First is macrofemina. Macrofemina is present all around the world. It attacks the stem at the collar, and it's linked to the yield. A sterile plant is never affected by macrofemina. But more you have yield potential, more you could be affected by macrofemina. And we don't have genetic answer to manage this disease. We have to work on global plant comportment. Uh, sorry. To try to find some solution. It's really complicated. The second disease also present in whole Europe is fusarium. In some company, we develop some molecular marker program to find QTL for tolerance to this disease. We have some genotype tolerant to fusarium. And the objective is to breed new variety, new parental line, and after new hybrid, tolerant to fusarium. So we use the technique of inoculation in the stem and in our population in segregation, we, try, we screen the best line, the best plant tolerant to fusarium. And we also look on the gene where are located the QTL for this tolerance. It depends on the genotype, it depends on the genetic resources. But we are more optimistic for fusarium than we are for macrofemina. A new, the new use is now for sorghum. In the past, uh, sorghum in Europe it was also for grain. Now we develop uh, sorghum for silage, sorghum for biomass. Uh, so quickly, rapidly, uh, we saw this morning that for sorghum we have three types of sorghum we can use for silage. The high grain tip, the BMR sorghum, and the sweet sorghum. We also have the biomass sorghum, but it's also uh, uh, it's for industry, for methanization. 
The advantage of BMR, you, you saw this this morning, is the digestibility, low lignin content, uh, UFL between 0 0.9 to 1, it's like corn. On the, the interest, on the, we have to harvest close to 30 to 35 percent of dry matter. You saw this this morning, so I go quick, fast. The some variety we develop uh, in France and also for Europe has the same advantage as corn. Also, you can see on the graph the data from last year for variety BMR variety with starch, for BMR variety with starch, low starch content, close to 15 to 20 percent of the global dry matter per hectare. We have the same ingestion of dry matter that corn. And we also have the same potential of production. We have to work more on the lodging tolerance. On also the drought tolerance for this type of sorghum. But as it was a new topic 10 years ago, and now the variety will be on the market, BMR with starch, resistant to lodging. It's uh, now uh, possible for the next two years. We develop sorghum also for human food. Uh, sorghum is a gluten-free cereal. As you see, we develop for poultry, for beer, for, uh, for main industry. Uh, this uh, data come from France. On the energy, is close, is stable. It's sure, it's around uh, close to 3,800 kilocalories per kilo of dry matter. It's close to corn, better than corn, usually. No big difference, but it's very really important that sorghum has a good energy in the grain. And a graph from 18, 1980 with the tannin level on the impact of the tannin of the digestibility. As you can see, and as it was uh, previously presented, the impact of the tannin is very really important. It's why we continue to want to develop only no tannin variety on the European market. There is no correlation between color and tannin. We can have very high tannin content with white sorghum and very low tannin content with red, oranges, brown sorghum. That's the main topic maybe we have to consider for the future. We have to continue to work on yield, sure, because yield is necessary to be competitive with the other crop. But now for the seed breeder company, you have to introduce some other characteristics for the future variety. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Very useful information for, uh, for farmers. Um, so uh, I'll have the I leave the floor to Mr. Christophe Ruyard for his presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and I'm very glad to be here today in front of uh, you to uh, this first European Sorghum Congress and uh, to speak about seed breeding, quality as an asset. 
Uh, I will focus my presentation on two parts. Uh, the first part on uh, how European policies can uh, improve uh, uh, the genetic progress in Europe. And the second part will be on how the, seed, uh, the European seed industry can answer to those uh, regulatory requirements, but also to the needs of the market. Uh, but maybe before starting this presentation, a few words about uh, myself and the organization I represent. So uh, my name is Christophe Rouillard. I'm working as uh, the technical manager for plant health and seed trade in the European Seed Association. The European Seed Association is the voice of the European seed industry. It represents uh, the interest of those who are active in uh, research, in breeding, in production, and in marketing of seeds uh, throughout Europe. And uh, the European Seed Association mission is to uh, work for a fair and a proportionate regulation of the seed industry. So that's why we are located in Brussels, uh, just nearby our uh, European policymakers. Uh, if you want uh, some more information about uh, the work uh, which is done uh, in this association, you can visit our website, uh, euroseeds.eu, or I will be very happy to uh, speak with you during the breaks of uh, this Congress about uh, the, the European Seed Association. But let's uh, now start uh, really with the presentation about uh, uh, seed breeding quality as an asset. Um, just to start with, maybe a general overview of uh, the seed productions of sorghum in Europe. So that's uh, uh, the figures for 2015 uh, for the seed production of sorghums uh, in Europe. As you can see in uh, this map, there are two main areas for sorghum uh, seed productions. The first one is in the western part of Europe. Uh, with uh, countries as France, Italy, and Spain. Uh, France is the biggest uh, uh, seed producers in Europe with more than 700 hectares of, uh, of seed production. And the second uh, area of uh, sorghum seed production in Europe is in the eastern part of Europe, where we are today uh, with countries as uh, Hungary, Bulgaria, uh, Serbia, and also, of course, Romania. So that's just a, a general overview of uh, this uh, seed breeding uh, activities in Europe. But uh, uh, now let's uh, start uh, really with the uh, European policies on uh, seeds in general and on sorghum in particular. So as you might know, uh, to put on the market a new variety, and this variety has to be registered in uh, a so-called EU catalog. To be registered in these catalogs, the variety has to fulfill some rules. Uh, that's the DU DUS and VCU test. And those rules are laid in a council directive uh, 2002-53, but uh, I don't uh, ask you to remind you the, the number of this directive. What is important is that the, the rules are on two tests, so DUS and VCU. A new variety to be put on the market has to uh, fulfill those two tests, and uh, it makes uh, uh, a genetic progress for new varieties uh, on the EU market. The first test the new variety has to pass is the DUS. So what's DUS? DUS stands for distinctiveness, uniformity, and stability. What does it mean? It means that uh, a new variety has to be distinct from the other varieties that are already marketed. So that's the D, dis distinctiveness. Um, the second letter, the U, so uniformity, it means that a new variety uh, has, a variety in general, has to uh, be, uh, as to, uh, within this, this variety, all the plants are to share the same characteristics in order to make the definition of this variety. And the S is uh, standing for stability. It means that a variety has to remain the same from one year to another. So that's the first test a new variety has to pass to uh, be registered on this EU catalog. And uh, what I forgot to mention is that uh, this um, registration on the EU catalog is mandatory 
to put the new variety on the market, I mean in the EU market. The second part of the test is about VCU, and uh, here is the part with the genetic progress that we can uh, uh, see, because VCU stands for value for cultivation and use. So it means that a new variety which is put on the market has to prove that the value for uh, its cultivation and use is better than the previous one that are already marketed. So um, when I talk about uh, value for cultivation and use, I mean, of course, yield, as Patrice uh, told just before. Uh, that's uh, one of the characteristics which uh, is under this uh, value for cultivation and use, but also some other characteristics on uh, disease resistance or uh, drought tolerance. So a new variety has to pass those two tests to be put on the market, and uh, with this, uh, the European uh, policies is um, helping the, the market to get a genetic progress for uh, seeds, and uh, that's also true for the sorghum seeds. Uh, just some figures about this uh, European catalog to see how many varieties are already uh, registered in the, in the EU catalog. So for the sorghum bicolor, there are uh, at, yes, around 250 uh, varieties in that catalog. For the sorghum sedan and say uh, it's around 20 uh, varieties registered and uh, around 50 uh, varieties for the hybrids between bicolor and sedan and say. So that's the first part of the European policies with uh, seed marketing and uh, in particular with the varieties registration. But to put on the market uh, a variety, we have of course to produce seeds. Uh, that's quite logical. And to produce uh, seeds, there are also some rules uh, by the European Union to uh, certify the uh, seed lots uh, that, were, that will be put on the market. So um, the rules are laid in another directive, it's the 66402 directive, and there are in this directive some uh, rules about the crop certification, and there are also some rules about the seed lot certification. About the crop certification, um, the, the rules that are laid in this uh, directive uh, concern, uh, um, in particular, uh, the vital identity and purity of the crop. Uh, and uh, to obtain this uh, varietal identity and purity of the, of the seed crop, uh, there are some rules about isolation. So it means that a uh, sorghum seed crop to, uh, be, bre to be bred uh, has to be isolated for, from at least 300 meters uh, from neighboring sources of pollen. Uh, with, uh, which may result in uh, some uh, foreign pollination if the crops are uh, less than this uh, 300 meter isolation. Uh, when I uh, mentioned uh, neighboring sources of pollen, it could be uh, some uh, field crops of uh, sorghum for grain or for seeds, but it could, could be also some uh, plants of uh, sorghum alepense. So that's the first rule, the, um, the seed crop has to be isolated for uh, at least 300 meters from other uh, field crops of sorghums and uh, sorghums in general. Um, to check this uh, varietal identity and purity, there are some official controls that are performed on the seed crops during all the breeding stage to see if uh, the maximum thresholds are, uh, not, uh, uh, are, uh, are met. And those maximum thresholds for impurities are just uh, written down uh, here. So uh, in the parental male line, uh, the seed crop should not uh, exceed 0.1% of impurity uh, in this, uh, in this uh, male line. For the female line, the um, impurities should not be uh, exceed 0.3% uh, at the flowering stage and 0.1% of impurities at the maturity stage. So that's the threshold which allow to uh, get 
uh, a crop certified uh, concerning the, the identity and the purity of the crop. So that's uh, the first part uh, of the rules in that directive for the crop certification. But uh, maybe just a small focus uh, on what we are calling impurities in uh, the uh, sorghum seed crops. So um, there are uh, five different uh, of types of variants or impurities uh, in sorghum seed crops. The, um, it, could, it could be some outcrosses from grain or for forage that are uh, neighboring the, the field crop. It could be also some plants uh, of Jensen grass or of, or, of Chetokan uh, that could be uh, in, the, in the field uh, of uh, the seed uh, breeding. And uh, the most uh, prevalent one is the H mutation. The, the H mutation, it's uh, the, um, yes, the most prevalent of types uh, that we may uh, find on the, on the crop, on the sorghum crops. And it occurs naturally when two inbreds are crossed. These soft types are genet genetically identical to the parent line, but there are just one mutant gene that allows the plant to grow taller than the other uh, plants uh, in the fields. Um, indeed, yes, because grain sorghum has four genes that influence the, the, uh, the height. And uh, three of those genes are uh, typically uh, promoting short plants. That's why sometimes uh, we refer a sorghum as a three dwarf uh, sorghum. Uh, however, uh, one of the three uh, genes, dwarf, uh, dwarf genes, is unstable at some times. And uh, the, this gene, particular gene, uh, can shift and promote some taller plants. This is when we uh, find this eight mutation uh, seen in the field, and you can see on the pictures uh, those uh, eight mutations. Um, but of course, uh, during seed breeding, there are some uh, field inspections that are done uh, on a regular basis to uh, eliminate those impurities. I mean, all kinds of impurities that we can find in uh, uh, the seed crops. And there are some official controls that are performed to see that the maximum thresholds are uh, okay with, uh, with the crop. And then the crop can be certified. I will show you in the next part of uh, this presentation uh, what can be the results and the outcomes of these uh, uh, crop certifications. And uh, you, you will see that uh, the seed industry can uh, deal with, uh, with these uh, requirements. So that's, uh, that's it about uh, the crop certification. Uh, let's uh, move now to the second part of the rules that are laid in this directive. Uh, I mean the rules concerning the seed lot certifications. So um, once again, uh, the um, sorghum seed lots, but yeah, seed lots uh, in general, uh, can be uh, marketed in Europe uh, when it's certified. So it's uh, a mandatory certification to put uh, some seed lots on the market uh, within the EU. So uh, to put a seed lot, a sorghum seed lot on the market, the seed should conform to some uh, standards. And the standards for sorghum is 80% uh, uh, of germination capacity. So the seed lots has to germinate at least at 80%. Uh, the um, minimum analytic, analytical sorry, purity uh, should be uh, 98%, and a seed lot should not contain other seeds uh, of other plant species as uh, sorghum. So that's uh, the standards to put on the market a seed lot. Uh, so that's uh, some European regulations that may help uh, the, the market to have some uh, quality uh, with the varieties and the seed lots that are uh, bring into the market. Uh, and the, the, the questions we may have is, uh, is the seed industry able to answer to those regulatory requirements and uh, is the seed industry able to uh, answer also to the needs 
of the market, to the needs of the users. And for uh, illustrating that, I will take an example. Uh, I will take the example of France, not because I'm French, no, it's because France is the biggest uh, uh, seed producer of sorghum in Europe. So uh, um, let's, yes, uh, have some illustrations uh, about uh, figures from France about the seed breeding and the quality of the uh, uh, seed breeding in France. So on this uh, chart, um, this is the number of uh, new varieties that are put on the market uh, that are registered on the French national catalog uh, each year. And what is uh, important to notice in this chart is that we can see from the last 10 years that are uh, some uh, very active breeding uh, activities that are, are done uh, in Europe and in particular in France. And it means that uh, each year there are around five to 15 new varieties that are put on the market. So uh, yes, the seed industry, the breeding industry can uh, put on the market varieties that are of course, suitable to uh, climatic conditions and uh, to the needs of farmers. Some other figures from France. Um, so that's the number of varieties that are multiplied. So it's the uh, figures from uh, last year, 2015. And uh, we can see in that chart that there are more than 60 different varieties that are multiplied in France. So it means that there is a, a really broad uh, multiplication, uh, uh, different types of varieties to answer to the uh, broad needs of the market. Uh, it was just for the sorghum, but you see there are also some uh, multiplication for the hybrids of sorghum uh, and for the sorghum, uh, the Sudan sorghum. Next uh, slide, it's about uh, some production. So as you can see uh, on this slide, uh, here is the production area of sorghum in France, so it's mainly located in the south part of France. Uh, of course, uh, sorghum is uh, uh, a plant for uh, thousand parts uh, of uh, thousand areas. Uh, what is interesting also in this um, graph, it's uh, about the evolution of the multiplication area in France. Uh, we may notice that uh, between 2010 and 2014, the multiplication area in France has doubled uh, from 40, uh, from, uh, sorry, not 40, but 400 hectares to, uh, to almost 800 hectares. Uh, so um, the, um, the seed industry is able to answer and to produce seeds uh, for the need of the market. About crop certification and uh, impurities that we can find in the crops. Um, the um, thresholds, uh, you remember I told you about this uh, just, uh, just before. Um, in terms of results of conformity for France, but it's quite the same for the uh, other uh, countries that are produce producing sorghum seeds. Uh, from, yes, that's the, the results from uh, 2014 and 2015, but this is the same. 99% of the crops were uh, confirmed, so were uh, meeting the regulatory requirements in terms of uh, identity and purity, varietal identity and varietal purity. So yes, once again, the seed industry can uh, produce and answer to the needs of the markets and to the uh, regulatory requirements. Just some figures about uh, crop productions. So uh, not uh, crop production, but certified quantities. Uh, that's uh, also the figures from last year. Uh, just uh, for you to uh, note that there are uh, 400 tons of uh, sorghum that are produced uh, by France last year, uh, 140 tons 
uh, that, are pro that is produced for the sorghum sudden by Bicolor and around 20 tons for the sorghum sudden. So, uh, yes, there are some uh, capacities in Europe to, to produce uh, seeds of sorghum. About the seed quality, uh, about the seed quality, uh, that's, uh, yes, one example for germination. Uh, I told you that the maximum thresholds for uh, germination, uh, the certific certification thresholds for uh, sorghum is 80% for the seed lots. And uh, as you can see on that graph, the lots are germinated much more than uh, the, this certification threshold. And on average, the uh, germination for sorghum seed lots in France uh, for last year was about 88.5%, uh, so a bit more higher than this certification threshold. So once again, uh, the seed industry can answer to uh, the European policies for seed quality and can answer to the need of the markets to put on the market some seeds of quality, uh, new varieties that brings a genetic progress and that uh, will be helpful for farmers and developing the, the sorghum. Um, I think that's it. So thank you for your attention and uh, Thank you very much. So we have uh, our uh, session for workshop two, question and answers, please. Okay. Are there any questions? Ah, okay. Если можно, вопрос господину Руланду. Я очень большое спасибо за такой подробный рассказ. А, требования к сертификации семян и включению их в реестр европейский. У меня вопрос такой. And, uh, а, какова цена? Сколько стоит? Uh, thank you for this answer, um, but uh, I think I, I couldn't uh, answer to this because uh, the um, inclusion of uh, varieties and hybrids in particular uh, in the catalog is uh, based on a national basis. So uh, I, I do not know uh, in Romania the, the price to list a new variety on a catalog. Uh, the um, European catalog is only the sum up of uh, all the national catalogs that are uh, already in place in each country of the European Union. Например, во Франции какая цена? Uh, that's, uh, that's a price uh, that uh, is based on, on, the, on, on how it costs to, to make tests, uh, to make this uh, DUS and VCU test. But uh, I'm not uh, the expert to answer this. I think there are some people in the room that are much more experts than me to comment on this and to uh, maybe bring some, uh, some answers. Thank you. Are there any questions? Okay.
doresc să pun întrebare celor trei amelioratori și geneticieni deopotrivă, francezi și americani. Am testat toate tipurile de sorg, soiuri hibris care au intrat în România pe partea de nord a țării. Ce mă ne mulțumește? Nici unul din hibris nu s-a încadrat în punct de vedere al cantității de căldură să ajungă la maturitate în zona noastră. Cu baza de 12 temperatură activă, noi nu realizăm din 10 mai până la sfârșitul septembrie, nu realizăm mai mult de 900 de grade active cu baza de 12. Ce aș dori? Aș dori pentru că reprezentantul din Statele Unite a spus că are toate metodele pentru a crea orice tip de, de hibrid de sorg, să creeze un sorg cu o producție de 8-9 tone și care să se încadreze în această sumă de temperatură. So basically it's an order, so you have to take care of this. <laughs> With that question I might have to stay in the United States. <laughs> You know, um, one of the things that I think you're going to have to be very careful with in sorghum for um, this part of the world is your maturities. We have different maturities for sorghum. So we do have early season, medium, and late sorghums. So I think it's really, really critical that you understand the maturities that you're looking at. So we have very early sorghums, some sorghums that will flower very, very quickly. Um, in the United States, we have a, a sorghum hybrid called Swift that'll flower in 46 days. Um, so I think you're going to have to really look at maturity uh, differences here, especially in Romania, it sounds like, in order to try and find something that'll get you something that'll be useful. Whether or not it'll get to you the tonnage that you uh, are, will need is a it's a good question. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so we'll move I, I've got one question for Jeff actually. Sorry, so, please. So there are many teams working on sorghum in the U.S. at the research level. So did you structure that? I know that you have the sorghum checkoff. What are the advantages of that? And how do you run research? Is there coordination? What are the advantages? In, in the United States, um, we have several different mechanisms for funding research. Um, um, at the farmer level, there's the sorghum checkoff, and I know Florentino and, and um, Brent will be speaking about the, the checkoff and what they do, but that's a farmer organization that actually collects funding from sorghum producers to then specifically fund. Um, the big projects that we are working on with the Department of Energy, the Department of Energy has classified sorghum as a priority crop for them for uh, bioenergy. So they funded several different groups um, to look at sorghum and its potential as a bioenergy crop in the United States. So this Terra project that we're working on, uh, we're meeting at least quarterly as a group um, to kind of discuss and work through the various issues that, that we may be having in our different research programs. We're using common parents, uh, common lines in some of our research so that we're trying to all build on, on our different research uh, parameters. The Department of Energy is a, is a new funding um, mechanism, actually, for us. It's, it's a little bit different um, strategy than what we've had in the past. Typically, we've gotten research funds from uh, the U.S. Department of, of Agriculture. Um, and unfortunately, there's not a lot of money, uh, like every other agricultural ministry or, you know, um, we, we don't put a lot of research dollars into agriculture worldwide. Um, it seems to be kind of a secondary thought to fund agricultural research. Um, so we depend a lot on our farmers to fund that research and some government support. 
with the Department of Energy um, and energy being such a high value issue in the United States, there's a lot more money that's going into research to look at alternatives to fossil fuel. So that has really been a new um, avenue of research for us. But we really do, um, one of the things that you'll find about the sorghum community is we're uh, a relatively small group. And so we typically all tend to talk to each other. And that's uh, really, I think, been very uh, useful in the sorghum community. Um, we've been very good at sharing information. So we've got groups you know, working with you guys. Um, and, and we're pretty open about sharing information back and forth because we are such a small group. So there's a, there's a whole wide range of different avenues to, to look at supporting sorghum research and uh, keeping that going. So I, I'd invite all you researchers to, you know, look us up and, and reach out to us because we're, a, again, a pretty small group um, and we all uh, have a very uh, strong passion about sorghum and we do like sharing our information with each other. Thank you very much and once again, sorry for not uh, being attentive uh, and careful. Okay, so we'll move uh, swiftly to a 20 minute, ah, another question, okay. So. This will be the final question, okay, thank you. Um, about um, eight plant uh, mutant, <clears throat> can you uh, explain uh, that this is uh, really uh, an anesthetic uh, uh, phenotype uh, because as I know um, a mutant plant is uh, uh, equal to uh, the variety and we have only uh, one character this is uh, the, um, uh, the height. Um, in, for example in, in America what is the feedback of this type of uh, anesthetic uh, character? about uh, tall plant on seeds production. Yeah, there's a, a DW3 gene in sorghum. Um, there's four dwarf genes, right? DW1 through DW4. There's more than that, but that's the real major four that we typically are concerned about. And I think what you're asking is why the height mutations DW3 is very unstable, so if you have a uh, uh, dominant DW3, it will flip and become a recessive DW3 and back and forth. So you'll see some of that mutation in the field. So um, it may not be an outcross, it may be actually this DW3 uh, reverting back to uh, either a dominant or a recessive characteristic. And uh, in America, for the farmer, it is not uh, a problem. Uh, it is a problem for aesthetics, right? Um, it's, it's identical, um, except you can see in a farmer's field. Like many farmers, you know, we, we like very uniform fields. Uh, we like our fields to look nice. And it doesn't look nice if you have a bunch of tall things in the field even though genetically it's identical. Um, and what will happen is those hybrids will be moved out of the market. If it is a real problem, and if that DW3 uh, is not very stable, it'll get moved out of the market. Okay, thank, thank you. you. We'll move swiftly to a 20 minute coffee break. Don't forget your mandatory bags of uh, sorghum ball. So uh, we'll meet there back in uh, in 20 minutes. Thank you.
workshop on crop management technique and agronomics. It's the last workshop uh, for today. And I would like to welcome uh, Mr. Jean-Luc Verdier, engineer with Arvalis Plant Institute. Thank you. Dr. Brent Bean, director in charge of agronomic at Sorghum Chekhov in the United States. Okay. So Dr. Okselenko from the University of Dnipropetrovsk in Ukraine. Hello. Thank you. And Mr. Nikolai Benko from the Agroplasma Company in Russia. So we're still missing Mr. Uh, Brent Bean, huh? Okay. Hello, thank you. Yeah. So the first presentation comes from uh, Mr. Jean-Luc Verdier. Mr. Verdier, you have the floor, thank you. Bonsoir à tous. Je vais m'exprimer en, en français. Je m'excuse. Good evening, pour, everyone. I'm, I'm going to speak in uh, Donc, uh, French. I'm very happy to be here during this first Sorghum Co Congress. I work for the uh, Arvalis Technical Institute in France, about which Mr. Ferrar was uh, talking uh, earlier today. One of my missions uh, is to uh, work in the uh, sorghum industry. I'm going to discuss the place of sorghum in the crop rotation in France, and then I'm going to get back to uh, the um, crop technology that we use. Looking at the uh, sorghum production in France, it is rather localized, namely in the two-thirds uh, in the, in the uh, two-thirds in the south, in the south of France, on the uh, Loire Valley. Uh, this is mostly grain sorghum. There are two uh, main production regions, historically. The first one is in the southwest uh, of France, in the Midi Pyrenees, and the other one is uh, here in the valley of the uh, River Rhone. On the um, right-hand map, you can see that sorghum is mostly cultivated around the Toulouse area with the surrounding uh, area collecting, procuring uh, sorghum. Sorghum has uh, taken swing in the ha last half, uh, in, in the second half of the last century in France, and uh, it has slowly got up to uh, uh, five thousand uh, or one hundred thousand uh, hectares, rather. We have. Um, uh, the benefit of uh, genetic progress and a range of hybrids that are well adapted to our specific conditions. One of the first characteristics is that we have uh, access to a large range of uh, um, precocity. The French catalogue uh, is very thorough in that we have three, we have classified of sorghums in, in three categor categories, very early and then uh, medium, early and late sorghums. Based on our knowledge about these varieties, we can uh, easily determine the uh, right range of temperatures needed for the uh, physiological maturity. For reasons of uh, is we are using the same uh, temperature basis that we use for corn. So it is, the key thing is to um, 
choose the right hybrids. We have two, for example, geographical reason, uh, regions with two different contexts. First of all, the needs of uh, temperatures and the uh, cumulative uh, temperature uh, range, the cumulative GGD. For the uh, southernmost region, we have a, on an average we have one category that of temperature range that is good for the uh, uh, late hybrids, the latest hybrids, actually. On the other hand, if we look at the other region, which is uh, more to the north in the Valley of Loire, the region of Tours, the climate, climate um, framework is uh, less favorable. The harvest needs to be planned before October, so we need uh, earlier varieties here. The late varieties have a higher production potential, whereas the earlier ones need to be harvested earlier. On, I think this ties in a little bit with your one of the earlier uh, questions here in terms of the uh, production uh, factors. These are the various uh, production regions corresponding with the, uh, to the uh, hybrids. According to the types of hybrids, you can see which ones work best towards the south and which ones in the rest of the regions. In, uh, as far as the uh, place of sorghum in, uh, within the rotation, being a crop that does well without uh, irrigation, it works with, with uh, cereals, uh, with sunflower and, uh, and uh, wheat, and uh, it enables uh, longer rotations. That way you can also manage uh, pests, the pest problem better, as well as the uh, diseases. Because the important thing is to uh, limit the effect of uh, pests. This is also a way of uh, improving the cropping systems. A longer rotation provides uh, more robust crops, whether in, term, in economic terms or in terms of the uh, uh, health of the crop as well. and uh, also in terms of the, the environment protection. So uh, sorghum works either with various cereals or with um, alongside sunflower and winter wheat. These are typical uh, crop rotation examples that we use in, in France. We can also include sorghum in a more innovative uh, system. <coughs> we can use uh, either uh, direct seeding. All these systems uh, allow for the introduction of sorghum and that uh, brings a, uh, a plus of, of quality. These are uh, rather innovative systems, all of them. This is a short panorama. Uh, for the uh, success of a crop, I think it is important to say that the moment of sowing is very important. And when the crop takes root, um, 
In order to provide a good routing, the first factor to look at is plant density so that the crop can reach its true potential. We have compared different uh, plant densities with very early and mid-early hybrids. With the very early hybrid, we've noticed that potential yield is reached only when the uh, plant density is enough. Yield depends on density, and if the density is too low, then you have a hard time reaching the, uh, uh, the actual uh, potential. This is a... Uh, you can tell the difference between the, the blue and the red. We see a different uh, situation with the mid-early hybrids. Again, what we can see is that at different uh, densities, we end up with a similar yield. So you can actually plan different plant uh, densities according to the uh, type of hybrid. Because in that, in that way, you can advise producers how to play with the two uh, aspects, density and uh, type of hybrid, early or late hybrid. The second element to take into account is the production conditions whether you submit that crop to any sort of stress, whether it's irrigated or not irrigated, again, the density will depend on that. Sometimes it is better to... Uh, an excess of density in limiting uh, uh, conditions can lead up to uh, water stress, for example. In uh, non-limiting uh, conditions in, and in deep soils and uh, with irrigation, the objective is to reach the potential yield and you can only do that provided you have the, the right density. And it all depends whether you have a favor favorable or unfavorable uh, growing context. This takes us to planting, uh, planning. Today, our recommendations, uh, these are our recommendations for the planting uh, dates, the seeding rates in good conditions. So this is uh, more or less what we base our recommendations on. Now, the second aspect I wanted to uh, emphasize is the uh, weed control. People generally think that weed control is the weak link in the uh, sorghum production. Yes, it is sometimes difficult. But sorghum in a rotation can have a uh, positive effect uh, in terms of uh, weed control. Grain growers in France have, for example, um, um, consistent uh, problems with uh, l'olium multiflorum with ryegrass, and they use rotation to control it, including uh, 
sorghum in it. So this is one way of, of uh, controlling uh, a wheat like that. Sorbonne can also, of course it doesn't work for everything, but it is a crop that can provide effective solutions in terms of uh, um, weeds such as convolvulus or um, Chirsium arvense. On the other hand, some other uh, weeds are more difficult to deal with. Uh, for example, uh, summer grasses. For example, millet, um, cockspur, finger grass, uh, yellow foxtail, and Johnson grass. For the time being, so, uh, Johnson grass is the most difficult to control, given its, uh, the fact that it's usually found very, very close to sorghum crops all the time. Um, there are also non-chemical -chemi weed control uh, methods, which we can use, such as, for example, the full seeding, which helps remove weeds before planting. After, for example, a crop like a sunflower or, or corn. On the other hand, we can also use uh, things like uh, weed uh, harrows or rotary hoes, which can be applied <clears throat> either uh, right after planting or at the early uh, seedling stage, or into row cultivators. As a complement to the uh, non-chemical weed controls, the, uh, there are also chemical weed controls we can apply. Uh, the phytosanitary companies, uh, of course, focus on, on major crops. Sorghum, for the time being, is uh, a marginal uh, and less, uh, less um, treated, so to speak, um, crop. It generally is uh, treated with uh, root um, products that have an effect upon the root system, such as the metolachlor. Provided that this is applied before uh, emergence, you can only apply it if uh, the seed uh, is protected with a safener. Uh, this pro type of product is available in Europe. If you, you do not have that, <clears throat> it needs to be applied after emergence, and uh, you lose in efficiency in that case. As far as um, the uh, broadleaf weeds are concerned, we have a wider range of uh, chemicals that we can use. Leaf uh, or foliar uh, products or systemical products, more classical products that can uh, uh, deal with the classical uh, weed population, weed species. A few caveats, however, when using the 2.24D on sorghum, one needs to be careful in terms of placing it 
it's important to uh, avoid applying it after the eight leaf stage because otherwise you may end up with toxicity uh, and even uh, sterile plants or even lodging. So careful with how you place when you apply this product so that you don't aff affect the crop. One, uh, the last but one aspect is the water efficiency. As it has been said many times already, this is a plant that can uh, put up with a lot of water stress. This is also uh, a crop that reacts well to water, uh, of course. I wanted to uh, illustrate here some results we have obtained after looking at uh, sorghum in irrigated and non-irrigated conditions. In 2010 and 2011, 2010 we had a high drought stress. When applying water, we weren't able to increase the yield. But in 2011, when the, when the drought was weaker, given the fact that the soil already had a water reserve, when we um, added water, supplementary water, the, uh, you can tell we could notice an increase in the yield. So there is a, some water efficiency depending on how much water is in, is in the soil. In, uh, if we have a relatively limited um, amount of water, however, that still is something for the uh, for the crop to be boosted again. Now, in terms of the harvest, sorghum is the only crop then uh, that uh, can be harvested when the grains are ripe, when, but when the leaves are green. So, the producer needs to, of course, harvest it at the right time when the kernel is as dry as possible, without, however, pushing the uh, harvest day too, too far. In order to better pinpoint the harvest date, for one decrease of one percent of uh, a decrease of one percent of uh, water in the seed, you need a five uh, fifteen uh, degree cumulative uh, GGD in base six. In order to prevent uh, uh, any further drying costs that could add up to the producer's costs. So the harvest generally, of course, takes place in autumn, autumn. and uh, when the, uh, the grain is uh, dry, you can have a plus of humidity, of moisture after rainfall. So the key is to find the um, best, the optimal point between the dry period and the re um, resumption of, of, uh, of rainfall. Thank you very much. This is all I wanted to share with you. And uh, of course, I'm uh, available for any kind of questions you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So uh, we find out what's happening in the ch 
champion country for in Europe for in, in terms of uh, sorghum crops. So uh, it was a very useful and interesting uh, experience and data that you shared. Thank you very much. Um, now I will have uh, Mr. Dr. Brent Bean will have the floor for uh, his presentation. Doctor, thank you very much, please. Well, thank you, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here from the from the U.S. and appreciate the last speaker's comments. I think uh, the things that I will say will uh, hopefully complement uh, what he's already discussed on production issues. Uh, as an agronomist, uh, you know, with, the, the breeders like to think they're the ones who are responsible for increasing grain yield, and certainly they are to some extent, but you don't want to forget about the agronomist. I think we, we play a role in that also, so uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. Uh, a little bit about my background, I spent 25 years with Texas A&M as an extension research agronomist, uh, then three years with, a, uh, with Next Step, a, a biomass sweet sorghum company, as their director of agronomy, and then the last year and a half as the director of agronomy for uh, uh, the checkoff. So really been working with sorghum for the better part of 30 years, and uh, it's an interesting crop and one that I certainly enjoy uh, working on. What I'm going to discuss with you today, first, just very briefly, you've already heard this to some extent, but why sorghum? Uh, I wanted to cover that. Uh, the sorghum yield components, as an agronomist, that's very important to me. And what I think about is, is what makes up the yield of sorghum. Uh, compare a little bit the local climate here in Bucharest to where I'm from in Texas, because that will feed into the rest of my presentation on water use. <clears throat> and then again, water use, and then sorghum in cropping systems. There we go. Uh, contribution to yield. Uh, let me back up here. I'm missing something. Yeah, why sorghum? Uh, drought tolerant crop. Uh, you've heard that before uh, at this meeting, and certainly is a drought tolerant crop. The previous speaker mentioned that it, sorghum also responds very well to water, and I think that's important. We talk a lot about the, the fact that sorghum is drought tolerant. Uh, but it also does respond to when you do have more rainfall, you have irrigation. And I think that's something as a group we need to focus on a little bit more and tell that story. It's not strictly a drought tolerant crop. Uh, it will respond to water. Uh, long planting window, uh, the comment of the question earlier today about uh, you know, the growing season here in Romania and needing a short maturing hybrid. Uh, we, we do have short maturing hybrids of sorghum. We have also very long maturing sorghum uh, hybrids. And so we can fit a lot of different environments from that standpoint. I think one advantage to sorghum also is just the equipment needs for sorghum. For the most part, a farmer is not going to have to change his equipment uh, to convert to using sorghum. <clears throat> and I think that's important. Certainly there's some rotational benefits to other crops, and I'll cover some of that uh, uh, as we get into the presentation a little bit. Um, and of course, one reason for the rotational benefits is the fact that those other crops, soybeans in the U.S., cotton, I think sunflowers, those all tend to yield better when following a sorghum crop. Um, and the reason for that is, is for disease control, uh, insect management, and then nematodes that we often don't think about. Uh, but sorghum is a very good crop to use in a rotation for nematode control. Uh, and then finally, uh, uh, you can plant sorghum in more narrow rows, and I think that can be a benefit from a weed control standpoint. As not only in, the, in Europe, but in the U.S., as we lose herbicides that we can use for weed control, uh, I think we may have to go to a more narrow row uh, cropping system. Uh, just for the, 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 the weed control, and I think uh, uh, sorghum does have a fit, uh, fit there. Let me get this straight in a minute. Contribution to yield. Uh, under limited irrigated conditions, the most important thing is typically the number of seed per, per panicle. Uh, these numbers that I have on the slide will vary from any given experiment or location, uh, but that seed number com becomes very important, the drier it is. Uh, so what you're wanting is, is a large head with, with, with lots of grain. Uh, panicles per head, as was mentioned earlier, certainly plays a role, and it plays a more important role as water becomes less limited. So the more rainfall, more irrigation you have, typically the more heads or seeding rates you're going to have to... Uh, uh, to plant. And then finally, seed mass. Seed mass, again, doesn't, make, doesn't add that much to the yield in a very dry environment, but it certainly does as you start increasing that yield potential at some point, you've got to have more seed mass. 
Harvest index is something we talk about in, uh, in the agronomy world. Uh, the thing about sorghum is very flexible. It'll adjust the, the yield, you know, based off of the environment. And it does that in two ways. One, it either tillers and produces more, more panicles that way, or that panicle just expands and you have more grain per panicle. So that's the way it adjusts its yield. What we would like, in general, is to have a high harvest index. So more grain per uh, amount of stover uh, that you have uh, in that plant. That's a more efficient plant. So that's what we want to strive for uh, to be more efficient uh, in, in, the, in the sorghum using its resources. Uh, this demonstrates, I think, this is a study done in Kansas, but it demonstrates the flexibility of sorghum in uh, adjusting the number of really heads and actually the, the yield that you're going to get uh, depending on the environment. Uh, in this particular case, we've got three different seeding rates. Uh, we're going to go to a fairly low seeding rate there of 75,000 and increase that either double or triple. And if you look at the yields on that, the yield doesn't vary much. Uh, the yield is pretty constant regardless of that seeding rate. So what is the more efficient plant here? Has the, har the highest harvest index? Well, it's that lower seeding rate has the, the higher index. Uh, and, and so that, there's an advantage to that if you do turn into have a dry spell, if you plant fewer plants, there's going to be certainly an advantage to that. Uh, now, you've got to have enough plants to reach your yield goal potential, and so that is very important to do those, do sitting rates in the environment that you're uh, growing sorghum and figure out where that sitting rate should be. Uh, this is the recommendations that I use in the U.S. Uh, uh, depending on the yield go. So the yield go for the most part is going to be determined a lot by the amount of water that's going to be available to that crop. Uh, but if you have a yield go of you know, 3.4 to 4.3 tons per hectare, then I'm typically going to recommend 75,000 seeding rate per, uh, per hectare. Uh, then that gradually increases with the higher, uh, the higher yield go. Because uh, again, at some point, you have to have enough panicles, enough, grain, enough, enough heads and to, to make grain to reach that yield goal that you're shooting for. But again, if I'm going to err, in my mind, I'm going to err more on the side of, of, of less seed uh, because it makes for a more efficient plant and it does uh, uh, help us if we do have those dry spells. Uh, <clears throat> this is the sorghum growing areas of the U.S. I think you saw a slide to this similar, uh, earlier in the, in the, in the day. Uh, where I am located, if I can get this to work, there we go. I'm located right in this area right in here, uh, in Amarillo, Texas. So I'm kind of right in the middle of a, of a big growing area uh, uh, for sorghum. Uh, in the U.S., we, we really feel like this area in here is, 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 gonna, is a big potential growth area for us. Now that particular area has a lot more, uh, a lot more rainfall. Uh, and this is just showing the, the, the rainfall map for the U.S. Uh, the area that I'm from right in here, that's going to get roughly 50 millimeters or so of, or 500 millimeters or so of, of rainfall a year uh, is about what we get, maybe a little less than that. But as you move further, again, further east, you get into a lot more rain, and, and certainly we can get some very good sorghum yields in those areas. If you move up just north of, uh, of Texas on up into Kansas, you can see there's some green areas over in there and some lighter colors. That's a higher producing area uh, for, for the U.S. So, so certainly rainfall drives uh, the yield uh, to a large degree on sorghum. Uh, but as, as earlier mentioned, with, with, uh, with uh, climate change and temperatures warming up, we do think uh, in the long run uh, conditions are going to favor more acres or hectares being planted to sorghum uh, in the U.S. Climate makes all the difference in the world as far as how much water is going to be required for sorghum. Uh, get that question a lot, uh, especially when I was working with Next Step and we get calls from, from really around the world, how much water does it require to grow sorghum? Well, the answer is it depends. It really depends on your local climate, on how much water uh, that's going to require. If you look uh, uh, at that, those first uh, few lines there, crop water need or ET, uh, if you have high temperatures, low humidity, windy conditions, lots of sunshine, it's going to require more water. Uh, on the other hand, if it's cool, higher humidity, 
uh, calmer conditions, cloudy weather, it's going to require less water. Uh, and so, again, it really depends on the environment. Just looking at uh, Amarillo, Texas, again, where I'm at, compared to, to Bucharest, and these are maximum uh, temperatures uh, in July. Uh, you can see, in all cases, Amarillo, Texas is going to be a more uh, harsh environment for growing sorghum, at least from a uh, ET standpoint, okay, from a water use standpoint. Now, there's other factors, obviously, in that, but strictly from a water standpoint, uh, uh, where we're growing sorghum in, in, in Texas there uh, is, is, is fairly harsh and requires more water than it would require right here in, in Bucharest. If we look at water use efficiency, again, that is going to change uh, depending on, again, how much water is available. Uh, looking at water use efficiency, it's going to increase to some extent with more water available for that plant. Uh, and it actually maximizes with sorghum here at about a 60% or so of the, of the ET value that you need for maximum production is actually where the water efficiency is at its greatest with sorghum. With maize, it's more like 75%. Okay, and then it begins to, you know, that, that line curves over and it becomes, becomes less. Uh, but uh, that is one advantage to, to sorghum over corn and that that maximum, ET or maximum use efficiency is at a lower level of, of water need uh, compared to maize. If we look at the growth stages of, of, of sorghum, I just wanted to point out some, some key growth stages because if you are irrigating sorghum, there's, there are certain times that you don't want that plant to stress to maximize yield. That growing point differentiation, now that occurs roughly 30 days uh, after, after emergence. Uh, and for about a two-week period, that's when the number of seed per panicle is determined, the potential number. And so you don't want that plant to stress uh, during that two-week period. Again, that's what's going to help increase that harvest index. Uh, the boot stage is probably the next real sensitive stage, and that's about a, just, just a few days before that plant is going to head out. Uh, from a lot of research has been, been done, we know if that plant stresses in that time, uh, you, you're going to reduce your yield. So that's probably the second, uh, if not the most important time, really, uh, to not let that plant stress. And then once you get into the flowering stage uh, and get past flowering and get in that early grain fill uh, it is also going to be critical, particularly for those high yields where you're trying to increase seed mass. And you certainly don't want any, any, any grain or kernels to abort uh, prior to that happening. This just illustrates that a little bit different, but this is over the, uh, the, uh, 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 the, the, the season and just shows, again, when sorghum reaches its maximum water use, which, again, is similar to, similar to maize. Uh, that maximum water use is going to occur there around flowering, so really about a 30-day period is where it's at its maximum. Uh, this data, again, was taken from uh, close to Amarillo, Texas, so the, the scale would differ a little bit uh, if you were in a different environment. Uh, on average, we're using about seven or so uh, millimeters a day on average. Now, in, in a typical day where I'm from, that could easily get up to, to 10, 11, even 12 millimeters a day in any given day. If it's very hot, very windy, uh, then that ET or water demand is certainly going to go up. Uh, but again, panicle initiation is real critical, and then that boot through early grain fill is going to be uh, be important from a water management standpoint, but, uh, but that's how the water curve looks for sorghum. And if we compare that to maize, uh, you can see there, there is you know, quite a bit of difference. Total water needed in this, in, over about a 20-year period where we looked at this, uh, you know, the difference there was, was about 200 millimeters of, of water uh, from sorghum compared to corn for maximum production in our environment. Now again, you put this you know, this chart in a different area, you may be 200 millimeters less than that in any given environment for both crops. So it really depends on that environment on how much total water is going to be needed uh, by the crop. In this particular slide, again, I'm looking at water use and, uh, and, and, and your, your, your water use efficiency and then your yield uh, and what to expect. This is a common question. At what point do I need to switch from maize to sorghum? And again, it depends on where you're at. It depends on the location. Uh, the, the blue line and green line 
Uh, one of these lines represents uh, 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 the Texas Panhandle where I'm at, and then the other line, the blue line, actually is, is, is further north up into Kansas. Uh, well, where those lines cross with the maize and sorghum differ, okay? So right around again where I'm at in Amarillo, Texas, those lines cross there at about 6.7 tons per hectare. That's the point that we feel like if you're less than that, you should be growing grain sorghum. And that doesn't account for any uh, of the economics for the cheaper seed and some of the cheaper input costs. That's just strictly on the yield. As you get on into Kansas, that number goes up uh, to, uh, to, to, to 10 tons, actually, uh, where we think that's kind of the breaking point. It's, you can grow more, corn at a higher yield than that, okay, then grow corn. But if it's less than that, we really think you should be considering sorghum. So kind of on average, if you look at that, and I think it's about eight tons, and that's probably a pretty good number to, to throw out if you're, you know, you're talking to somebody, where's the breaking point when you want to uh, grow sorghum versus corn? I think also that's really important to look at on this particular slide is when you start making grain. Okay, that's very important here. Uh, with corn, it takes you know, considerably more water there. I think it's like 275 millimeters or so in this particular example uh, to begin to make grain. With sorghum, it's much less than that, okay? And I think that's an important consideration, and that goes into the drought tolerance of sorghum uh, and why it's better at those lower uh, uh, yielding environments. Uh, this is some data, again, from Kansas, but again, it just illustrates what I just showed on, on the previous slide. Uh, again, you, you, you'll notice the maximum ET is somewhat less than I showed you earlier for Amarillo, Texas. Again, about 200 millimeters or so less, but there's still a big difference in the total amount of water needed between grain sorghum and, uh, and, and corn. Uh, and then that, that threshold ET, that's simply, again, the level that sorghum or, or corn or any of these crops starts making grain. You've got to have so much water just to get to the point to make that grain. And then cropping systems in the U.S. and, uh, and finishing up here with, uh, with a couple of slides. Uh, under dry land or low rainfall conditions, typically what we're doing in the U.S., uh, in those really dry, dry environments, we'll actually just grow two crops in three years. Okay, we have some good soils. We can, uh, we can store a lot of soil moisture, and we rely on a fallow period of about 11 months just to store water in the soil for that next crop, uh, whether it's sorghum or wheat. And that works very good for us in a, in a, in a really dry environment. Uh, you can see here wheat planted uh, no-till into wheat stubble. Uh, rotation with cotton or soybeans is very common uh, for us to do that in, the, in those drier uh, environments. And again, because of the reduction in disease, weeds, and nematodes, you tend to increase the production of those other crops. Under limited irrigation conditions or um, moderate rainfall, typically the rotation is going to be with soybeans uh, in Kansas and in the southeast. It's, it's typically with soybeans. We'll also have some double cropping sometimes where we plant sorghum right after wheat harvest. We'll typically harvest wheat towards the third uh, week of June, something like that, and then we'll go right back in when we have good rainfall in that particular year and plant grain sorghum and get a second crop. Now that would be a shorter maturing grain sorghum typically that we would plant uh, in that conditions. Uh, <clears throat> we also have some circles where we're irrigating that will split with, uh, with sorghum uh, and, and maize. Uh, to make that, that whole system more efficient. I'll show you a, a slide on that in just a second, or sometimes it's a cotton sorghum split. Uh, and then under full irrigation, uh, or regions with high rainfall, then, then typically, again, that rotation is going to be with, uh, with soybeans or maybe cotton. Uh, what we will do with sorghum, we will change the planting date in our region depending on uh, you know, really when, when we, you typically get the rainfall or maybe with some temperatures in mind or maybe even some insects in mind, we'll change that planting date uh, to fit the, the, the region. Uh, but if you just look at from a, from a water standpoint, uh, we can shift when that crop is using water just by moving our planting date. Uh, and it can be fairly significant, but there's always other things to consider in that. But we use this to match up with other crops uh, to, to, to make our water go further and, and to best utilize that water. Um, certainly one system that we are doing is planting grain sorghum with maize. So we'll have half a circle with, with, with a maize and then half a circle uh, with, with sorghum uh, and, and then use those planting dates again to, to make that system work. 
Uh, typically what we'll do, this is just showing one year, uh, and you can see how the water use changes on any given day depending on, on the environment. But we'll plant, uh, we'll plant maize early, typically around the, the, the 15th of April, and then we may not plant sorghum until the, the second week of June. And you can see how we're spreading our water use out by doing that and making that irrigation system more efficient for both crops is, is, is the goal of doing that. In summary, uh, sorghum water use uh, efficiency uh, is improved by using CD rate that matches the environment and yield potential. I think that's very important. And, and really, every, every region is going to be a little bit different on what that sitting rate will be. Some regions, you'll just get more tillering, typically, than you'll get in other regions. And that's temperature, that's primarily soil temperature driven. But that's, uh, that's something to, to consider. Uh, sorghum water use to piss, uh, uh, efficiency very much depends on that local climate. Uh, you, know, you can't just throw out one number and expect that to, to, to fit every environment. It simply doesn't work that way. Uh, sorghum has a maximum water use of approximately 75% of corn. So typically if I get a question from some region I'm not familiar with and they're asking me, you know, how much water sorghum is going to require, uh, you know, I could throw out a number like what's well, going to require 600 millimeters. But really if I don't know anything about that environment, that's a hard question to answer. But most environments, most places, they've grown maize. And so I think a good answer is it's going to require 75% of the water use of corn. And that's going to work most of the time. Um, Sorghum years are going to be better than maize in low rainfall environments. And then something we certainly want to always stress is that typically when we rotate sorghum with a broadleaf crop, we enhance the yield of that broadleaf crop uh, the next year. Uh, and then finally, uh, sorghum can be planted with other crops to maximize water use efficiency in those systems where you've got limited water uh, from irrigation particularly. And with that, I will entertain questions in, during the discussion time. Okay. Thank you very much. A very interesting and useful outlook of American situation. We wait for you in your Europe too, if you think it's it's a good idea, because your your, your background and your knowledge is uh, Thank you. okay, and hopefully we'll see to share with the with Romanians farmers your experience and your background, because even in Romania, as the minister mentioned at the beginning, uh, the interest in uh, in sorghum crops in, in it's increasing year by year. So, uh, thank you. So I, um, I um, Dr. Uh, Oxelenko will have now the floor for his presentation. Doctor, please. Thank you. Добрый день, уважаемые коллеги. К вашему вниманию доклад на тему выращивания сорга зернового в основной зоне Украины. Исследования проводились. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to going to talk to you about the uh, sorghum uh, growing in a sorghum crop in, in Ukraine. We have a technical institute, technical institute in uh, Dnipropetrovsk with six uh, laboratories uh, that uh, has looked into this uh, uh, crop. We have various uh, branches as well as uh, organizations where we also employ students, 40 uh, of the um, s people working there are uh, uh, acad academics. Then we also have uh, 50 scientists with doctoral studies. What you can see on this map are the uh, sorghum areas in the Ukraine, represented representing about uh, 75 to 80,000 hectares. The largest area uh, is located in the steppe uh, region of uh, the Ukraine, in uh, regions such as Saborozhye, Nikolaev, Kherson, Dnevopredrovsk. In the next 
Here you can see the standing density. By regions, in the southern steppe, between 120 and 140, the purpose of our research is uh, improving the uh, our uh, agronomic uh, practices for sorghum. Uh, sorghum dash E. Uh, in the conditions of the Ukrainian steppe. Weather conditions in 2015. Uh, in this next stage, these are the agrochemical characteristics of the soil. The soil is black soil. The humus is about 75 uh, centimeters deep. The humus content is 3.9 percent. Soil density is about 1. 14 grams per cubic centimeters. Therefore, we can talk about a soil that is relatively um, well uh, aired. The um, nitrogen and phosphorus content is uh, different. This is a map of uh, grain sorghum. Our growing technology includes, includes uh, um, plowing, uh, herbicide treatments, uh, sowing, then at the uh, three to five leaves, a reserve, a backup herbicide and uh, as pests appear and weeds, we also apply uh, fungicides and herbicides. During one of our experiments, we have tried to correlate into row distance. Fertilizer use and the shape of the uh, final um, head. At a distance of 30 centimeters, the number of uh, grains was uh, 1,077, and the more fertilizer we used, the more uh, number, uh, the higher number of uh, grains we obtained per head. When using a different uh, fertilizer, we noticed a difference of 400 grains per uh, panicle. At 70 centimeters, the number of grains was uh, 1,217, 1,174, and then with NPK, NPK it went up to 1,280, and then to 1,541. At 70 centimeters, without fertilizers, the number of grains per head was 1217, with a low dose of uh, fertilizer, 1325, and with higher amount of fertilizer, 1623. So, the amount of uh, 
The amount of sorghum for one head was uh, impacted by the uh, rate of fertilizers. We also weighted them. So we looked at the 1,000 grain weight at three interrows. As you can see in this picture, this is the number of uh, grains for the 1,000 grain weight. This is um, more related to the NPK application rather than the inter-row spacing. During our experiments, our field trials, we've also looked at the other situations such as, for example, an, um, an inter-row spacing of 70 centimeters. Uh, we looked at the grain yield in tons per hectare. At NPK uh, 60, 60, 60, the amount went as high as 7.84 tons per hectare. The reduction of the interrow distance led to the increase of the uh, yield because of uh, the climate change. As climate changes require a review of the rotation in favor of drought-resistant crops, sorghum is one of the most promising crops for grain cultivation in Ukraine. In our experiments, the highest yield of grain sorghum is, is obtained on the row spacing width of 70 centimeters with the dose with a, at a rate of uh, mineral fertilizers, N60, P60, K60. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, Mr. Nikolai Benko will have the floor now. But before that, I have an important announcement from, uh, from the organizers. So everybody who confirmed the airport shuttle are uh, kindly asked at the departure tonight, uh, uh, not tonight, but after the, the Congress, to uh, pass by the registration desk. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Benko, you have the floor. Thank you. Дорогие коллеги, так как здесь не так много русскоговорящих коллег, я буду докладывать достаточно медленно, чтобы наши переводчики смогли успеть перевести довольно правильно, а вы осознать, что же они вам сказали. Я сделаю небольшой обзор о том, что есть сорга для России. It's not mine. За последние пять лет объем производства и выращивания сорга в России and cultivation has changed greatly, as in Europe. This is not a very significant crop, which is why the change in cultivation areas has changed about tenfold, and that has to do mainly with changes in annual climatic conditions. After a dry year when the production, the yield in other cereals dropped and sorghum showed good productivity, then sorghum uh, was uh, cultivated. In the last 15 years in Russia, 
About 200,000 hectares have been uh, cultivated with sorghum. In terms of areas cultivated with sorghum, there are three Russian regions where the, uh, sorghum uh, crops are concentrated. I'll now refer to grain sorghum. The statistics of sorghum cultivation for uh, sweet sorghum and uh, Sudan sorghum hybrids. We don't have data for that, but we can extrapolate uh, on the um, surfaces, the areas cultivated with sorg generally. I'm f uh, part of the selection committee for selecting seeds of agroplasma. About 30,000 uh, sorghum cultivation norms are applied. Sugar sorghum, sweet sorghum and Sudan sorghum account for 80% of, of these volumes. To extrapolate, we can say that the volume of um, various sorg varieties is ab about 80% of grain sorghum. Going back to the diagram of aerial distribution, of uh, territorial distribution, there are three regions that accumulate more than 90% of uh, sorghum crop uh, cultures. If we look at the map, these areas are in Rostov, Volgograd, Saratov. About 45 to 50 degrees longitude. It's perhaps the northernmost cultivation area of sorghum in Europe and Asia. For Russia, early sorghum is of great importance. If we look at the gross yields of sorghum, you'll see that there's a, a real growth which has to do with an extension of the cultivated areas and an improvement of practices. In the last 15 years, productivity has gone up by about 50%. And that has to do mainly with the fact that new uh, varieties uh, emerge and cultivation uh, technology improves as well because for a certain type of sorghum um, farmers have the, the opportunity of selling sufficient amounts of sorghum so there is interest for sorghum and thus the cultivated areas increase. As the previous speaker said about the cultivation of sorghum in the U.S. This has to do with um, areas. Uh, I'll be speaking about the Rostov region because it's one of the leading sorghum cultivation areas. It doesn't have enough hum humidity and that puts sorghum at an advantage compared to other cereals such as uh, barley, uh, wheat, uh, or maize. The asset has to do with uh, the fact that there's a four to five tons per hectare productivity. If we were to look at who cultivates sorghum in Russia, we're dealing with 10 selection institutions. The main directions followed in Russia are first selecting varieties, early varieties. As explained, we have the northernmost cultivation areas in Europe and Asia. Hence the importance of uh, neutrality to daylight. In the selection program, there are such 
lines that do not modify their length during the growth period, especially before blooming. by uh, locating the cultivation area more to the north or to the south. Another selection criteria for Russia resistance to cold. There are two options. We can develop plants under low temperatures. And another important char characteristic for us is frost resistance. Uh, that sounds a bit extravagant when we speak of sorghum, but there are selected hybrids that are hardy to minus two or three degrees centigrade. And that has to do with the fact that, for example, in the Saratov or Orenburg regions, when the crop is uh, seeded in May, uh, negative temperatures can resume. And they can, uh, temperatures can drop to minus two or three degrees centigrade. And it's important for us not to lose the crop. Another important characteristic which um, establishes the sorghum crop as an alternative is drought resistance. The whole cultivation area for sorghum in Russia is an area where corn cannot be profitably cropped. Any cereal that can be cultivated in Russia must be drought resistant. Under irrigation, uh, we pr virtually uh, have no irrigated sorghum crops in Russia. When it comes to sweet sorghum, there is an interest to obtain liquid uh, sugar uh, for molasses as an alternative to sugar beet. And there are hybrids and even commercial uh, varieties with which uh, high uh, sugar content, up to 20% uh, glucose in sugar syrup. When it comes to the selection of grain quality, of quality uh, to be used both as food as uh, well as uh, animal feed, it's important to, to have a high protein content, and there are hybrids that have up to 16% protein. Also, it's important to have a high lysine uh, content, over 2%. Tryptophan, 1.2% is the uh, maximum limit of uh, new varieties selected in, for Russia. And one fundamental issue in terms of quality is to develop hybrids with low tannin uh, content or even tannin free. When we look at what kind of varieties are cultivated in Russia, besides hybrids, we cultivate lines, line varieties. Um, for grain, almost 100 different varieties are registered, of which 55 are line varieties. If we are to look at the sweet sorghum, there are even more line varieties there, of 45 registered. In the EU. In Russia, there are 28 hybrids of Sudan sorghum. 
the main institutions dealing with uh, breeding of uh, sorghum in Russia and cr who create Russian varieties are six institutes. The Institute for Sorghum and Maize in Saratov, the Research Institute of Agriculture, also in Saratov. These are government institutions dealing uh, mainly with sorghum selection. In the Rostov area, there is one institute dealing with all cereals. That's also a governmental institute. In Stavropol, there's a research station institute which are part of the VIR testing station. And there would be another two institutions. There's a private company based in Rostov, the Sorghum and Soybean Institute, and the Agroplasma company in Krasnodar, uh, which I represent. When it comes to the cultivation system uh, for sorghum in Russia, the typical scheme contains the following uh, stages. The precursor of the previous crop is usually wheat and corn. Plowing is mandatory. Cultivation is done when the soil temperature is 12 to, 12 to 14 degrees centigrade. Usually, in the last uh, um, part of May, uh, seeding density, the sowing rate depends on humidity. Um, usually, 250 seeds per hectare. Row spacing is 70 centimeters, sometimes 45 centimeters. And for Sudan grass, the row spacing is 15 centimeters. We don't usually use herbicides because certain compounds are forbidden in Russia. We only use herbicides during the growing period, usually 2.4 D. We do use insecticides and uh, subsequent uh, cleansing uh, when the harvest is picked up. A few words about the Agroplasma company. We deal with uh, the production and uh, selection of sorghum grains. Our main crop of interest is sunflower, but we are also part of a innovation center, Skolkovo. We take part in two sorghum selection programs, namely sorghum, sweet sorghum as an alternative to sugar beet, uh, technology, uh, technology for obtaining sugar from sorghum is under development. We have to create hybrids with an over 20% sugar content in the sugar syrup. And the second ambitious program is a super crop of sorghum with very good drought resistance and very good nutritional parameters for food and animal feed. Thank you very much, and we hope to find partners willing to work together with our company based in Russia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, 
So this uh, basically concludes the the uh, workshop. And now uh, to conclude the first day uh, of the Congress, it, it is now time uh, to hear the farmers and the practitioners. But before that, I would like to uh, kindly ask you to uh, have the questions for the, our distinguished guests guest at, at this workshop, please. Yeah. Вопрос касается глубины посева. Является ли это важным показателем в технологии выращивания сорга в разных регионах? Я вижу, что культура откликается на ширину междурядей, на количество удобрений. Имеет ли значение глубина посева? Does the crop react to the interspacing, and does it matter how deep you plant sorghum? What other elements uh, are important? I mean, I mean, you've spoken about many elements. What about the depth, the planting depth? Is it important? Спасибо за вопрос. Thank you very much for your question. I haven't really looked into this issue as far as soil uh, planting depth. But the technology talks about putting them in at about seven centimeters deep. So about five, four to five centimeters. It may be at six to seven, but sorghum is a uh, uh, rather weak, rather weak at the seedling stages. So there is no point in putting it at eight, uh, in, at least in our region, in a region like Dnieper Petrovsk in, in the Ukraine. We have good plus minus temperatures and a good moisture level at this uh, during that during the planting season. So we usually put it in at four to five centimeters deep. Uh, it isn't really an issue to us currently. What we are thinking uh, is to look to look into the um, safe nor protection or protection of, of the uh, or something like you know protecting the grain somehow so that it can in emerge. Um, more successfully and, and you know, better past the, the critical period. Do you use a special drying product before harvesting? Thank you. There is a special harvester that you use uh, for uh, yeah. It's done with the with the conventional, with a conventional uh, harvester, to, uh, specific equipment. The the cutting uh, you know table for the uh, differ anything else any you know compared to what we use. John Luke, but also to comment on planting depth. Planting depth is very, very important in sorghum. Typically in the United States, we're planting at about three to five centimeters. You don't go very much deeper than that unless you have a lot of moisture. Um, but for John Luke, I was a little surprised at your plant population it seemed awful large for sorghum. In the United States, those, those would be on the really, really high end of um, fully irrigated um, sorghum plant population. So I'm just wondering how you got to those those numbers. Alors, je pense que les différences. Well, I'm thinking that the, the difference in, in plant densities recommended in the U.S. and France, I think, have to do with the difference in the um, uh, hybrids grown in, in our respective countries. I think uh, we're, we uh, focus on 
uh, you focus on, on later hybrids. I was uh, making a parallel between the density and the optimal optimum uh, material st stage. I think it's one of the reasons why uh, that would explain the, our recommendations of density. In terms of the soil depth, yeah, I completely agree with you. With sorghum, we are dealing with a rather short kind of um, a cereal plant, and uh, it doesn't need to go in too deep. We usually work with two to four centimeters in France in order to, you know, make it easier for it to, to emerge and, and develop. Uh, about the, the intro uh, practices, I have some example uh, where a farmer use uh, uh, intro at around uh, uh, 80 centimeters. Uh, what is your preconization for the density depending to the Earliness in Europe, our practice it is uh, early material like uh, in Russia and uh, Ukraine. Uh, what is your preconization about uh, this high uh, intero uh, size? Firstly, uh, need to explain that in Russia we have some equipment more than. 70 centimeters. In this case, we didn't uh, test in uh, 80 centimeters, for example. Uh, but uh, if uh, think about the, our opinion of this question, I think for early sorghum need to decrease into roads, and uh, better would be uh, 45 or maybe 15 centimeters. And we have experience. Sometimes we have good a yield in 15 centimeters. Yes, I agree with you. I might just comment a little bit on populations and row spacing. <clears throat> what we see in the U.S., typically, if you have to get to a fairly high yield level before going to a more narrow row spacing will, 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 will work for you or, or will increase yield. Uh, I would say that's typically going to be around that six ton area. Uh, if, if, it's, if, it's, if the yield is less than six tons, if that's your goal or what your potential is, a lot of row spacings will probably work. Once you get above that, uh, that six ton uh, yield potential, then I think the more narrow rows can potentially give you a higher yield. Okay, thank you. Are there are other questions, please? There are other questions? Da. Ah. Yes, for, uh, for uh, the Arvalius Institute. I'm not really clear, of, clear in my mind. I would like to... You were talking about three early, medium, and uh, late hybrids with, uh, for which you're using six bases of temperature. What's the amount of actual, actual heat that you use for each category? Is the uh, six base? I mean, to me, six, a basis of six is extremely low. Sorghum does not cope with six degrees, with a basis of six, for a longer amount of time, because it, it, it misses germination. Even so, I mean, it has a very ro low germination rate. I mean, if it stays even two or three weeks extra in the soil until the weather is a little warmer, it's, uh, you know, it just misses out. If it misses out on, on plants and you, you lose density, you lose yield. I don't really, you know, I cannot draw the link between you and your farmer. I cannot tell him to, you know, go to my farm and say, no, you planted six. And, and, and he'll see a difference of four tons. I mean, economically, I'm, I'm killing him. It's, it's, a, it's a question of yield. And this is how things should be viewed. Huh? It's, a, it's about density, of course, uh, planting period so that the uh, farmer can actually attain its, his goal. Uh, d'accord. Donc, I'm completely, I completely agree with you. 
If uh, I need to, um, I mean, this recommendation of planting date, uh, we are absolutely, we absolutely agree. You have to put it in red only when when you're about at uh, 12 degrees. In order, I mean, it has to be uh, warm enough in order to favor uh, emergence. So the uh, right conditions have to be there. Now, in terms of how you calculate the uh, temperature, temperatures, uh, you know, accumulation, yeah, it's the, the cumulative value of two days, looking at, you know, starting from a six basis, because what you see is that because you, you actually tend to be a bit biased in, in terms of uh, temperature needs. When you evaluate the needs in temperature, uh, when you do your maths of, uh, in, uh, with a, ba a six basis, Starting with the planting date, in order to, to you, you know to plan your, your your date, you actually deal with two different um, two different things. First of all, the optimum temperature for uh, uh, for emergency and the temperature needs, actually temperature needs, which can be which can be estimated relatively uh, uh, reasonably. Because once you reach May and, and in the uh, in the summertime and in the autumn, the the temperature difference is is relatively uh, small uh, in relation to the uh, length of the uh, crop development. What's the moisture at harvesting, so that the soil can be can be maintained in a good shape without you know uh, affecting the the grains? I mean without them to you know getting mold how can how can i harvest it so that we you do not have any sort of drying uh, costs uh, generally speaking they should be harvested uh, uh, below 20 percent uh, moisture in order to you know also be able to store it Sorghum usually needs to be dried in France in order to uh, get get it to the right level. So only a, a small amount of the um, of the uh, harvest is actually harvested without it uh, needing uh, drying. Uh, you know. Questions, please. Hello, uh, I have a question to Mr. Benko. You said that you already developed uh, frost-resistant sorghum varieties, and I was wondering, apart from which stage of the cultures this frost resistance works? This is a stage after uh, germination, and when we have three two, three leaves in the early stages. Do you understand? Okay. Because uh, for us, very important, uh, some uh, uh, minus temperature in the germination stages. Because, and this, this is the main problem. Thank you. Question. Ah. How, how come that in the United States sorghum is uh, considered to be a good forerunner for uh, other crops? Because it leaves uh, very few weeds. Because in Romania we have a problem with weeds, with the weed control. The reason that they're using sorghum in rotation with, say, soybeans uh, or, or cotton or sunflowers is, as much as anything, is to introduce a, a different class of herbicide to control those weeds. We have a big issue with resistance developing of, of, of the weeds, and so if we can change to a different mode of action of herbicide being used in, that, in sorghum compared to just continuous soybeans, 
that's going to go a, a long way in helping, helping to control those weeds. Uh, the, the other reason that, 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 that sorghum is a good crop for a rotation with soybeans or cotton is the fact that we do leave that crop, that stover, that residue on the surface, which from a water uh, conservation standpoint can be very important and will help uh, uh, add water to the soil for that next crop. So that becomes very important. Other questions, please? Okay, if there aren't any, we go to, thank you very much for your presentations. <laughs> and now I will, I will kindly ask to the farmers and practitioners, Mr. Uh, Josef Schrabauer from Austria, Mr. Yvonne Parer from France, Mr. Fegzak Gabor from Hungary, Mr. Paolo Sforzini from Italy, Mr. Dragod Dragicescu from Romania, and Mr. Sergei Pigiani from Ukraine. This uh, open discussion with the, or, which has the purpose to share your experience with, uh, with sorghum, uh, I have, it's going to act like this. I have three questions for each of you. Would you be, I will kindly ask you to answer those three questions each. And after that, we will uh, discuss with the audience with the Q&A session. So my f uh, three questions are, what made you decide to grow sorghum? Uh, what type of sorghum it is and what are your market? Where do you sell your, uh, your, crop, your crops? And uh, what problems did you encounter during uh, uh, cultivation of, of sorghum and how did you overpass them? So um, I will uh, kindly ask Mr. Schrabauer to begin uh, the answering those three crucial questions concerning sorghum. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so the first question, um, why do I plant sorghum? Uh, at first you have to know that farm sizes in Austria are very small. Uh, and also my farm is not very big. I have only uh, 30 hectares. And uh, these 30 hectares have to produce enough feed for 600 pigs. So we have to plant high yielding plants. And you know the most important plant for this reason is corn. Some farmers planted corn uh, each year as monoculture. But now we have problems with corn because of diabrotica, the western corn rootworm. So we have to find alternative crops and yes, the uh, uh, grain sorghum is best suited uh, for this reason. After two or three, uh, now af um, after two years of corn, we plant one year sorghum. Uh, the yields are a little bit lower, lower than corn yields, but higher than the wheat yields. Uh, I live in the northern part of Austria and, uh, and I harvest about 10 tons dry grain sorghum per hectare. Farmers in the southern part of Austria have better climate conditions and they harvest about 13 tons uh, dry grain sorghum. So the advantage of grain sorghum for us is that we can use the corn production equipment. So we use the corn planters, the corn cob mix mills and the corn silos for making a 
Grain Sorghum Silage. So we harvest uh, grain sorghum with a moisture of about uh, 20 to 30 percent water content, and then we make um, grain sorghum silage. silage. And uh, we use the uh, silage for our pigs, and our pigs grow very well with sorghum, similar to the uh, corn based feeding. Each year you can see more and more uh, sorghum fields in Austria. In our co country, three years ago we had 1,000 hectares sorghum, now we have 3,000 hectares. And I plant uh, sorghum since eight years. Also, non farmers love grain sorghum because in autumn it makes a beautiful red uh, colored field. And I think that's good for the image of the Austrian uh, agriculture. So what uh, was the problems uh, by uh, uh, sorghum production? In the first years, a few varieties had uh, problems with pollination. Uh, I don't know, but I think um, that... Um, um, Yes, we, we uh, had cold summers and so these varieties were uh, infer infertile. But now, we, um, uh, but now only well adapted uh, varieties are on the Austrian market. And in the first years we had also problems with uh, the wheat barnyard grass, that's, that's uh, Echinochlor cruz galli. Uh, this wheat we can only kill uh, while the juvenile stage. Therefore, it's necessary that we use safe and treated seed, so we can spray pre-emergence herbicides like uh, dimethanamide P or s metolachlor Yes, thank you. Oui, bonjour tout le monde. Alors, je suis agriculteur dans la région du sud de la France, entre Toulouse et les Pyrénées, sur un secteur... and did not require dedicated machinery for seeding or harvesting. You could use a classical combine. Later, there was a politi political reform. Which led to the support of uh, sunflower. The sorgho has perdu en compétitivité. La marge brute était beaucoup moins intéressante que celle du tournesol. Et donc, petit à petit, les surfaces ont diminué sur mon département et sur ma région du Sud-Ouest. Au point que quelque part, ben, il a fallu ceux qui sont restés, qui ont fait du sorgho, je dirais, étaient un petit peu téméraires. C'était ceux qui croyaient vraiment. Et en plus, il y a une nouvelle catastrophe qui est arrivée avec la disparition oh, de la molécule qui s'appelait à l'époque la trazine, qui était très efficace. Les pionniers qui ont vraiment cru dans le sorghum, tels que le panic, le digitaire et la CTR. Donc, euh, on a connu un petit peu euh, une période de And then, qui fait que quelque part, le sorghum était plus ou moins rentable. Une zone où le sorghum était plus profitable. There were herbiciding issues, and we needed a lot of time for the interest in sorghum to be revived. Herbiciding has improved now. We now have some better solutions available. In my region, sorghum has become an important crop once again. 
Many farms don't have any irrigation capabilities. And thus, we've witnessed a, a leveling out of, of uh, the development of sunflower cropping. So uh, crop rotation systems have changed. New disease resistance has occurred, putting sorghum back in its rights. In my region, in the southwest of France, for several years there have been some pests and uh, migratory birds which previously only passed through, only transited our country, but now since global warming, they have settled in. And the crops are attacked by them, so much that some farmers uh, sow sunflower once or twice a year, and then, uh, then uh, shift to sorghum. I have continued to cultivate sorghum in my, on my farm. The costs make it competitive, and uh, we cultivate sorghum with simple means, then rotate it the crop with wheat and sunflower. But the problem I have encountered is that the soil has to be very finely prepared for wheat. Uh, the hay has to be ground and all the residues in the field so that it is all well mixed in with the soil to have and also to have uh, as few pest attacks as possible coming from the soil. I think that's an important uh, problem. The simplified techniques, one or two prior machine passes, and also before seeding, sowing, to have uh, to apply some herbicides so that we can sow the sorghum directly when the soil has warmed up. Mr. Fekzak. Good afternoon. My name is Gabor Fekzak and I'm on uh, behalf of Ogrosemek LTD Hungary. Our uh, company was founded in 1990s, and the main profile of our company is uh, uh, breeding uh, seeds, sorghum seeds, uh, growing uh, sorghum, and uh, uh, making the market for selling uh, for export, for example, uh, bird food uh, mixing companies. Or a uh, new uh, direction uh, you can find in the hall the sorghum balls, you can taste it. Uh, so now this is for the human consumption. Uh, first of all, in the 1990s, there was uh, lots of cows in uh, Hungary, more than 4.5 million. But nowadays it decreased uh, nearly uh, half a million. So in this case, uh, nearly the uh, 2000 years, uh, we have to change our profile to breeding progress uh, uh, increasing for, for the, uh, uh, for the uh, grain uh, sorghums. Uh, the main importance of the, uh, uh, by the sowing is the temperature, temperature of the soil. So uh, we have got the results that uh, the average temperature of the soil is uh, higher than uh, 12 Celsius degrees. Because of uh, in these Celsius degrees, the sorghums uh, can be growing uh, more homogen and the stability uh, will be uh, better than the uh, colder ones. This is the first. The second one is the timing of the herbicides in using the herbicides. In our country, in Hungary, we can use uh, concept three uh, treatment. 
this is uh, against uh, the S metal occlor, so you can use a pre emergent stage, so after sowing, till two or three leaves uh, of the sorghums. So it's very necessary because lots of partners of ours, uh, maybe uh, they finish this uh, time, so after three leaves, uh, against the now um, grass uh, weeds, so the monocotyledon weeds, we haven't got any choice uh, in Hungary uh, to protect. The second one, so the, the board leaves, so the dicotyledon weeds, we have got more possibilities. Uh, I saw in a, in a presentation lots of them, uh, bromoxenia, A24D, and so on, but it's very necessary that the 24D is still the six, maximum eight leaves, not at all, because uh, in a, um, when uh, farmers spraying after this stage, it can be a problem with, uh, with, the, with the flowering. So it's very necessary to using the exact uh, time, so the timing is the main importance by the spraying uh, method or spraying system. The third one is, uh, is the harvesting time. Uh, the harvesting time uh, for us uh, necessary because uh, the market we are selling uh, these products is mainly for the mixing uh, companies uh, who can uh, producing bird foods. And uh, they are looking for uh, or searching for uh, goods, uh, sorghum seeds, which are, which are uh, only the good quality. So usually in Hungary, the harvesting time of the sorghum is between uh, the sunflower and the corn. And, uh, some, uh, and usually we get the problem that this is the uh, lowest, uh, yield, your lowest uh, um, hectares uh, the sorghum in, in one company and usually they started uh, harvesting with the sunflowers and uh, they uh, starting uh, after the sunflowers with the corn and uh, they left uh, the sorghum on the fields after the harvesting of the corn. This is uh, not so good uh, for us because these products can be uh, selling uh, for exports because of the rain, uh, the humidity of the uh, uh, morning uh, conditions is quite uh, damaged uh, the quality of the sorghum. So for us it's the quite maintenance the, 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 the quality. So I think it's uh, very important to change the exact date of the harvesting. It's in our country, it's nearly the second, uh, third part of December, so nearly the 20th of uh, uh, September, sorry. So the 20th of September. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Mr. Sforzini now will have the floor. Good evening and uh, thank you for the invitation in this interesting uh, Congress. I came uh, from Italy, in the north uh, of uh, Italy. I produce uh, sorgo since uh, 1999, and uh, especially uh, grind sorghum. Uh, why I produce uh, sorghum? Uh, in fact, uh, for, um, it uh, takes uh, another uh, investment uh, like uh, corn and uh, the other uh, product. Also, um, is, uh, it, it takes uh, not uh, water like, uh, like, um, like corn. And uh, I have not a problem in, uh, in the field. The only um, important aspect, uh, I think, is the um, um, problem for the, um, could be the cold at the beginning on the showering in uh, light soils. Um, sorgo is important for, for it because uh, it's uh, becoming most popular for, uh, because it's gluten-free, it's rich in uh, vitamin and uh, antioxidant. Um, another important uh, aspect is uh, need only 50, 50 kg potassium for hectare and uh, 100 kg uh, urea. 
that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dragicescu, please. Bună seara. Mă numesc Dragicescu. Good evening. My name is Dragos Dragicescu. I'm a farmer in southern Romania from the county of Old. I've been uh, growing sorghum for uh, about 10 years, and we've always been pleased with it. At any rate, sorghum yields are much higher than corn. Uh, they're about uh, five uh, tons per hectare, whereas for corn we don't get over three tons per hectare because of our uh, drought problem and uh, lack of irrigation. We do not have any particular problems with sorghum, except, of course, the drought, which is an overall uh, uh, concern in Romania. Um, we do not have any such, um, how should I call them? The only serious problem I've ever encountered was uh, during harvesting, where in uh, October or even November, we had to harvest sorghum because rainfall started and the land was very moist and we couldn't get in into the fields. Um, the farm was quite large, and we really had a lot of uh, losses. Um, as I said, we started growing it 10 years ago, and over the past three years, we've been able to um, develop our drying facility, because until seven years ago, we, uh, lost, we had profit losses because we had to, to sell it quite quickly after harvesting because we didn't have any sort of means for drying it. But now we've been able to raise our profit due to that. So for the rest, I think my colleagues covered it all. Thank you. And now uh, Mr. Pijani from uh, Ukraine. Da. Yeah, okay. uh, when uh, I'm waiting for the for my colleague, we produce uh, we uh, on about 100 and 125 thousand hectares. The, our main problems in Ukraine have been um, the uh, growing season between. Early May, because in May we, we often have uh, minus temperatures and frost, and and it gets to ripen in October. This year we had a lot of fog, for example, in spring, and that caused us some problems. We do have a drying facility, and we dry it after the, the harvest by using gas, which increases our costs. Also, during our first year, uh, migratory birds, which uh, on the first year just stopped over, so to speak, and they destroyed our crop. Our main use is it's uh, used as um, an ingredient in a, in mixed feed. Uh, it's a French sorghum with low tannin, and it's very good for us. I think we are going to improve our range of sorghums because we st started growing it precisely because of the climate change and the drier and drier weather we've been dealing with. And this is where we actually grow it in the areas that are prone to, to uh, dryness. Thank you. At 48 degrees latitude. Thank you. Okay. If you have questions for our uh, farmers. We need a microphone here up front, please. Je vais parler en français parce que je suis un peu fatigué. 
Uh, I'm going to speak in French because I'm a little uh, tired. I've done some research on the internet and I've noticed that the introduction of sorghum in the Toulouse area started in, uh, six, uh, in uh, 58 because I found an article in a newspaper in Toulouse where they were talking about, uh, about that. So that's a piece of information also. What should we do from your point of view? So that uh, the uh, sorghum areas in the south uh, west will, will yeah. go up again, uh, not only in France but else, elsewhere. What I think uh, happens today is a restructuring that is uh, um, happening in several countries because people become aware that there are several of us that can work for this industry. What's happening, at least in France, uh, the uh, sorghum industry does exist, but it has never, never taken, taken off because of the reasons that I've been mentioning. Uh, major handicaps in terms of treatment, and also the um, price will, has always been lower than the corn. I remember that when I was much younger, we had um, created the uh, 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 sorghum, but the, it's still at some distance compared to, to maize. Another problem that we have in France is that at some point there were about uh, 100,000 uh, hectares of sorghum or even more and that allowed us to have a reserve so to speak for the livestock industry and uh, this has continued to be the main use for it De façon régulière, chaque if mois, we cannot provide constantly sorghum to the industry, surtout, they uh, are going to lose interest and uh, resort more to anything else but sorghum, like maize and, and uh, barley and what have you. Uh, and then, uh, you know, come up with all uh, other types of protein and like, you know, coming from oil seeds and so on. The most important issue, of course, to us, besides the fact that we need to, to double our area, I think we would be much, much safer if we had a, a larger area. Uh, as far as my region is concerned, there is an aberration because you have uh, livestock farms that are still quite important and that are still, you know, surviving. <coughs> the main use, uh, users of uh, French sorghum are, however, Spanish. Around the Barcelona. And you, and you, of course, uh, retrieve it under the form of, I don't know, ham, a very, uh, you know, bearing a certain brand. I think this is quite unfortunate. And this, um, just as one of my uh, colleagues was saying earlier, the, uh, the, uh, we haven't treated this crop very well. It's always been, um, you know, the last crop out there. And uh, the warehouse, uh, again, warehouses, first of all, dealt, would usually deal with sunflower, corn, and anything else but sorghum, and then sorghum. All the warehouse stockers, at least in my region, collect the sorghum at the moment. However, we must say that at this, at this point they, they do a very good job collecting, the, you know, procuring the sorghum and drying it and bringing it to very good uh, quality, both for food and for feed. The main factors that uh, could help, I think, uh, you know, securing our, our producers in that point, from that point of view, I think that what we need to obtain 
is coming up with earlier hybrids, ideally, you know, hybrids that could be planted in Mars and that are uh, tolerant to uh, cold with very good um, uh, seedling vigor and that can uh, come up to, uh, you know, uh, heading and uh, flowering at the right time because, uh, of course, clearly the um, weather is warmer and warmer. But in July and August, you have uh, even very hot temperatures, and even sorghum has a hard time um, passing this, this period, and you end up sometimes with uh, non-negligible uh, yield losses. From 90, you, you, you can, you can uh, go down to 80, you know, uh, I, Q per hectare. I'm wondering if any of the, your, your farmers belong to a farmer association for sorghum, or is there anything like that in your countries? Okay. <laughs> yeah. The lady here in front uh, will have a question. Seed producers, they say that uh, sorghum is very interesting culture, and if you keep seeds in storage even for a few years, the quality of seeds is growing even and germination will be better than in first year. Is that truth or not? Do you have any experience? Thank you. Is this for um, uh, grain or is this just seed sorghum or just the uh, food or feed use sorghum? What kind of sorghum are you talking about? For both, if the sorghum is, is harvested in the right conditions, and then, uh, yes, it can uh, withstand two or three years in storage, yes, that's true. But often, uh, often enough, enough uh, harvest takes place at end September, early October. We, uh, the important thing is to harvest early, and it's important to retain what has been said earlier. Starting from a certain stage, with a cer uh, after a certain stage, um, sorghum no longer gains in uh, moisture, and uh, as the uh, days uh, shorten and nights, nights become longer, with the exception of rain, uh, sorghum can get uh, yeah, moist again, and of course you need to, to dry it and so on, and that takes time. The question was initially, for example, if um, one of uh, seed producer have stock of their seeds and they hadn't sold it this year and kept for few years, two years or three years, and after that they sell it to farmers. And they say that quality of these seeds are improving during these three years of storage. So when you will use it as a farmers, your yield will be even better because germination quality is even better after three years of storage. Is that truth or not? Not really. <laughs> Be because of uh, so when we are harvested the uh, the seeds of from the production, uh, the germination is uh, 
for, for example, nearly 86 uh, percentages. And we are waiting for the next year uh, for making the whole processing, the treatment and so on. And the next year when we are selling it and we are measuring uh, new again uh, the germination, it can be higher. So not, 80, well, not uh, uh, 86, maybe 88 or 89, it can be. But uh, in, uh, after three years, it's, it's not, not ego. So uh, it can be uh, growing, but only one year or only to the season, till the, the sowing time. Okay. I, I can help answer that question too. Um, I was a sorghum curator. If you store sorghum at about 10 uh, degrees centigrade and 50% relative humidity, you can store sorghum and keep sorghum for 50 years. I mean, that's what we do in the United States when we are uh, keeping germplasm for a long time. If you're doing it for a seed company, it's very different because you're trying to move seed pretty quickly out of your system and you're treating it. And if you treat it and you let that seed treatment sit for a while, it can really cause problems. We can actually store sorghum seed in minus, um, I think, uh, 80 centigrade in liquid nitrogen, we believe, for about 250 years and keep the germination high. So it depends on how serious you want to get about uh, for storing your grain. <laughs> I know that Dragos uh, produces a lot of sorghum and I wanted to ask him what uh, his production was like this year and what did he do with it? Well, this year wasn't exceptional for me, for sorghum. Uh, we had to plant it in half June. Uh, in mid-June, um, the, uh, the production wasn't terribly high. It was just uh, it's about maize. Um, sorghum does sell in, in Romania. It is looked for. We've sold it to pig farms around us, uh, to various uh, mixed feed compounders, and everybody adjusted their rations, both for corn and for sorghum. And I wouldn't see any reason why it wouldn't sell. As long as I provided with the right, I supplied with the right moisture level. You can you can store it. You can feed it. You can. I don't know why. The price, um, the price was about 10 percent, exactly 10 percent below corn, at the same level of protein and so on. Whatever. Whatever we want to wish for, we are farmers. However, I mean, we have we have our you know, we we deal with economics. We uh, just you know, as against corn, you cannot where you cannot go above four tons. With sorghum, we went as high as seven or eight. For my area, this is quite an, an alternative. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Hello. Uh, this question is uh, addressed to all of you. Uh, what kind of herbicides are you uh, able to use in your countries? Uh, since uh, in uh, the northwestern part of uh, the European Union, uh, we are uh, quite limited on, uh, on the use of uh, the type of herbicides. So also on, a, on an EU scale, this is uh, a very important question, I would think. So we usually use uh, pre-emergence stage uh, s metalochlor and after um, against the dicotyledon, so the board leaves, uh, weeds uh, with uh, dicamba. So usually we do the, this uh, processing uh, all, all, um, the every year. So s metalochlor in the pre-emergence stage and after uh, we can use uh, dicamba in a six to eight leaves uh, stage of the sorghum. Uh, usually you can use uh, terbutilazine also. Uh, it can be used the pre-emergence stage and uh, nearly the two leaves, but this is the half dosage of the, of uh, which, which can be right down the, 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 the um, dose. Romanian 
is the same. <laughs> Austria is the same. <laughs> US the same. Excuse me, a question. What about the Kamba on a stage six, eight leaves? On my experience, it's quite dangerous for the plant because it's a very strong phytotoxic. Uh, is a problem in your region or not? Because in our country, from Ukraine, there's a real problem. What we are saying to our customers, to our partners, you cannot use uh, higher than, just in case, in secure, higher than uh, five leaves. Uh, otherwise, if you use even the Kamba six leaves, something, we, how we say we are doing anti-stress program, uh, you know, micro fertilizer, some case like this, different no, products. Normal is the maximum the six leaves. So the eight leaves, it uh, depends on the weather condition and so on. Yes, so the maximum, uh, the normally is the six leaves. Here in Hungary, we are uh, using uh, six leaves and the inter-row cultivation also, so all together. Okay, thank you. We'll have to conclude the... Thank you. Thank you very much. A great applause for our farmers. Thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, we are, uh, with this, we are concluding the, the first day of the Congress. Dear lady, thank you. We are concluding the, the first day of the Congress. Thank you very much for your interest and for your patience. Um, two important, uh, again, practical uh, announcements. Um, we will have the meeting with the poster uh, in um, with the posters. Uh, we have the session in the in the lobby right now after the after we concluding this uh, first day. Uh, Dinner will start with an aperitif at 9.30 and then at 8 o'clock, uh, at uh, 7.30, sorry, 19.30. Okay. I have to apologize my, for, for my, uh, from time to time, um, uh, unforced uh, language errors that vaguely remind me about uh, the difference between Italian mafia and Scottish mafia. Italian mafia, as you all know, they, they will make you an offer that you cannot refuse. Unfortunately, the Scottish mafia will make an offer that you cannot understand, so. <laughs> okay. So, aperitif at 7.30, the dinner begins at 8 o'clock. Tomorrow, a big, big request to start at 8.30 sharp because we are trying to uh, cope all the, all the um, workshops and the presentations, and we have that tight deadline with the, with the sh uh, airport shuttles and your uh, flight timetable. So I would kindly ask to be here at 8.30 8 to start the second and last day of the Congress. And once again, uh, all the person that confirmed the, the airport shuttle are, are uh, kindly asked to right now to go to the, to the registration desk. Once again, thank you for your, uh, for your uh, interest and your uh, patience. Have a lovely evening uh, at, at, the, at the dinner. 19.30, it's the aperitif and at eight o'clock we start the dinner. Thank you very much, have a pleasant evening. Ah oui